This programme features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. A very good afternoon to you all far and wide from the Maasai Mara here in Kenya. We have a lioness over there. My name's Lauren and I do have Big James on camera today. It's a very hot day. The lioness is feeling hot, I'm feeling hot and I'm sure James is too. A nice 29 degrees Celsius and 85 degree Fahrenheit. Now, believe it or not, this is a shepherd tree and this lioness was sitting perfectly up in the tree for about 30 minutes. And of course, just as the show was about to start, she decided to too clumsily I think she landed with quite a bang on the ground and she's much more comfortable lying on the cooler soil. So today we're going to stay with her for a little bit, but please do talk to us. Send in your questions and your delightful comments using the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter or indeed on the YouTube chat stream. Now, we're having a bit of a discussion about who this lioness is and we're actually very close to our camp. We're not too far and we are in the region of Olololo territory. So the Olololos have made a kill away up the escarpment, down the hill, and they're actually feasting on a zebra. So this lioness could indeed be part of the Olololo pride, but we are still trying to figure that out. We had a lovely view of her bottom earlier, and it is just now we are really starting to get a look at her face. So it's still not confirmed exactly who she is, but we will get there, and she does appear to be completely on her own. There is not another lion in sight only herself who was very comfortably perched up this tree and obviously decided it was not good enough and she decided to come down so it was amazing to see this lioness up here because it's normally leopards you see up a tree and not lions so it was a fantastic start for me and it's great to be with her so we're going to stay a little bit longer and figure out who she is but for now i'm going to send you across to david Yes, it's quite interesting to see a lioness go up a tree, but I think it's more, you know, interesting to see it also come down because lions are not designed either to climb trees or come down. And hello, hello, everybody, uh, Jumbo Jumbo. A very warm welcome to this other side of the Mara. We are in the Sausage Republic. My name is David Azushu, and with me on camera is Bungay. Definitely, Lauren has to do everything, but just as a reminder, don't forget to keep interacting with us. I'm talking of comments and questions, and as usual, hashtag Safari Live. Well, we do not have a lioness, but we've got two elephants and buffaloes, maybe about six buffaloes, that two of them are standing up and about four of them that are laying down. And my guess is these are two different species, buffaloes and elephants, but my guess is all of them are males but more so to the elephant facing the right. You see that one there? No question about it. That one is definitely a male. Now, either he is interested with some female somewhere, and not sure the one that is on her left is a female. I would also want to believe it's a male, but we are going to investigate uh, him much closer. But you can definitely tell he is looking for some male somewhere. Now, I've always looked at all the animals that I know of in the African wilderness, but I think the elephants have the biggest penises. So we're going to have, well, he just turned the other way. We will not be able to have a look at it. And they weigh a lot of kilos. I'm trying to remember how much one would weigh, but it was a lot of kilograms. And she, he could be looking for some females elsewhere. To the far left of those two alleys, Noshobunge, you can see three little dots there. And I'm trying to imagine those ones could be some sort of pigs. Yes, those are white hogs. Excellent, those are white hogs. So in that one small area, we got white hogs, we got buffaloes, and we got the ellies. And the three different species of animals have been brought there by one commonality. That area is very green, it's very lush, and also there's a spring of water. So is what I've always said, water is life. And it's water that has put these three different animals that are not related together. Well, 
To the far right, Bungay, there's another huge herd of elephants. Uh, thank you for that buffalo. And I think that one male elephant is where it should, he should go because I would believe in that particular herd, there could be some <coughs> female. But whether going there or not, so long as there's no female there that is in stress, it will not help. Magic, I agree with you, and just look at the beauty of the Mara Triangle. Apart from the animals there, Magic, why don't you look at that landscape? And, I mean, sometimes when I look at the Mara, I just go, wow. I mean, seeing three different species of animals all spread out and all coexisting very peacefully, it's wonderful, isn't it, Magic? It's so quiet where we are. I'm looking at about being a mile or so away from where all these animals are. And as you know, Lauren said, we've got pretty warm temperatures. I mean, uh, when we talk over 85 degrees Fahrenheit, for me, it's quite warm. Or 29 degrees Celsius, that to me is quite warm. But the long rains in Kenya have started and humidity being high, temperatures going high, is nothing out of the ordinary this time around. And what you've seen the last few days is like every afternoon we have gotten some showers. I personally feel a bit of, uh, you know, high humidity and maybe rather late at night we might have some rain. Well, my plans today, ladies and gentlemen, is to look for lions. And which lions am I talking about? I earlier said I am in the Sausage Republic and definitely I'll be looking for the sausages. Well, myself and Lauren, we're in the Mara Triangle in Kenya. Steve is in Juma, and I'm sure he would like to say hello to all of you. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome down to a nice sunny, warm day in Juma, where the temperature is 32 degrees Celsius and uh, 86 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is Steve. I'm joined by David on camera. And sorry, we just reversed back there to frame up a red-billed hornbill. There he is. He's busy calling. I'm doing his very interesting little up and down motion. The red billed easily identified from the southern yellow billed by, well, the red bill. The southern yellow billed has got a very nice yellow bill, also known as the flying banana. And this guy, well, affectionately known as the flying chili pepper. And as yesterday, we had the yellow bill hornbill on the school drive busy doing pretty much the same as this, sitting in the shade, doing a little bit of preening in the <laughs> in the heat of the day, he's talking, or she's talking, to his girlfriend somewhere nearby. We can hear them calling. Um, when they do their territorial sort of demarcation during the breeding season, the two of them will stand together and do that... ..do that up and down bobbing motion with their wings normally a little bit more open. And um, it adds a little bit of sort of depth to the, the call that they make. I don't really know how it works. Um, what about the look that they put on is supposed to scare off intruders, uh, but it seems to be the way of the hornbill. Monique, most certainly not. The hornbills are some of the most common uh, of the birds we find around here. Yeah? The, the, the two most common being the southern yellow-billed and the southern red-billed hornbill. This one being the red-billed. And uh, while well, their breeding successes are very, very good because they actually hide the female away in a hole or cavity in the tree. And they actually cement it up with mud and also some fecal component from the female. And there's just this little keyhole split like that, that the male's able to come and feed her. So they are very successful in their breeding. They could have between one to three chicks. And if the season is a good one, they will successfully raise three chicks. And we see many, many hornbills around. Next to starlings and dubs, hornbills are probably the third of the most common birds around. And it's got a lot to do with how they breed. It all comes to be successful. They don't migrate. And they've got very, very good abilities to switch their diet from insects to fruit. Uh, to whatever else they feed on. Insects and fruit being the pr primary sort of driving force. They also land on the floor and scrape through the elephant dung 
looking for, and rhino dung, looking for any grubs and insects that might be growing in there. I think this might be his friend over here in the tree, or is that a roller? That might be a roller, in fact. Another very, very common bird, or am I seeing something completely out of place? I think I'm seeing a log. The, the, oh, no, there is a bird there. Oh, Darby. It was a dove. It's gone now. I thought I saw something that was not that. But anyway, if it was a roller, they're also quite common. Uh, we do see many of them around, but they're not as prevalent as the hornbills. Okay, well, we're going to be searching for some tracks for leopards and lions today. See what we can find out. And while we do that, let's go up to the Masai Mara where Lauren has already found a lioness. And here I have my lion. I feel very lucky to be with this lioness right now. We're still not sure where she is because look at her beautiful position flat as a pancake as some would say so we're still not sure but for, from what we can see definitely a young lioness definitely young and i'm just wondering if she is one of the young ones from the ololo pride or not the mysteries that lions throw to you you can just never quite get around it but one of the good things is that the breeze is picking up on this stifling hot day so it's given us a little bit room to breathe and it also does mean that it will start to get cooler and the lioness will indeed start moving at some point now just yesterday we also had another lioness who made a warthog kill and we just missed the kill and of course it was kids drive so i think my personal feelings is it's going to be a really good idea to stay with this lioness for a little while once she gets cooler i believe she will get up and you never know what she's going to do i like to figure out exactly who everybody is before i leave the animal so although she's flat and probably dreaming quite happily from what i can see here i do wonder what lions dream about Although actually, maybe it's better I don't know what lions dream about. However, she looks rather comfortable, but I assure you, once it just gets a little bit further on in the day and the conditions change, we have got some dark clouds up ahead, which I'm a little bit worried about. But the past two nights, the rain has held off. So we hope tonight it also will hold off. And of course, I am really intrigued to see exactly what this lioness gets up to and where she goes. Where is she going to go? Is she going to contact? contact call and reunite with her pride you never know sometimes lioness don't like being on their own they will go off on their own they'll be independent they'll do their own thing but then when it's time to join the pride again they can get quite stressed and they can repetitively contact call and it's not the nicest thing to see they need their pride. They're part of a pride. It's who they are. Lionesses are prides. So hopefully we can maybe see her reunite with some others and then the mystery could be resolved and we could figure out exactly who everyone is. But for now, our social cat is not being very social and it's just lying flat as a pancake. Now, when we first came to the sighting, you could just see the outline of a cat in the tree. And from very far away, it just looked like a leopard. It was extraordinary. And then when we got closer, of course, you could see it was a fat lioness perched right in the fork of that shepherd tree there. It doesn't look very comfortable from where I'm sitting. Oh, hey, girl. Kristen's asking, do lions love climbing trees? I've never seen them do it in Juma, but out here in the Mara, it's a regular thing to see lions climbing trees. The Owinos are famous for it. You will always see the Owinos climbing trees. Lions also love to stand on their back legs and stretch right up against the tree and sort of use their claws to scratch, sharpen those, well, claws, stretch their bodies, you know, real yoga position but climbing yes they do so we also saw the sausage tree cubs up a tree was it last night or the night before I get confused but we saw them up a tree so lions do enjoy climbing trees it's just not something that people generally associate with lions and they're definitely not famous for hoisting their kills into tree and Kristen kindly reminded me it was the night before sorry the days just roll out here when you're having fun so it was not last night it was a night before we saw the sausages up a tree so leopards are the ones that are really designed with those huge shoulder blades and all the 
power and all the muscles in their upper body to really not only pull themselves up trees, but to hoist their kills as well. They are notorious for it, but lions aren't. That's not what they do. But out here in Namara, they just love climbing trees. And it's, it's just fantastic to see. I'm not sure why. And it's probably because it's really not something that you see regularly in Juma. I'm not saying it doesn't happen down there, but it definitely happens a lot more common out here. So David is also looking for his lions and I believe he's now entered the Sausage Republic. So let's go and see what he's up to. That's very true, Lauren, and hopefully you're gonna see more than that one particular lioness uh, you saw. You're gonna see, if you're in the Ololo territory, that's one area, you might see one of the largest prides that we got in the Mara Triangle. Well, I stopped here, just trying to investigate uh, what we have in those trees up there. But once in a while we have seen the sausage pride climbing all the way up. You see those huge rocks there? There's some big rocks that Abunga is going to show you. Abunga is the one who's managing the camera today. But not necessarily today for the lions that I'm looking for those rocks. We have particular types of antelopes that we call clip springers that will always go on top of those rocks. Or if not, the clip springers we have seen once in a while, some uh, little animals that we call some rodents, like we call the hyroxes. Uh, the rock hyrox, they like to climb there. But before I go to where I'm thinking I might get the sausages, I thought I will stop and make sure I'm not leaving anything uh, behind. The last I saw on those rocks up there, it was two small little cubs, and I guess they belong to the female called Kingtail, and they were right on top of that particular rock. Not that they could be there today, definitely they have moved. That was like uh, way back two weeks ago. But again, you never know. So let's just move on because it won't be long before we smoke these uh, lions out. What I've done today is to go to a totally different area, an area I have not been for a long time, where I would guess they could be hiding. Well, I've said this many times. It's the green season now, and if you don't have as much prey as the lions would want, I'm sure Lauren might have mentioned it uh, or not, but uh, without the wildebeest and the zebras, it becomes a bit difficult for the lions to keep eating and to keep hunting. So they have to uh, deal with tougher prey. I'm talking about the buffaloes. And every time we are looking for this particular pride, I'm always fast uh, looking for buffaloes and not once, I would say eight out of 10 times, that kind of trick has helped me to locate uh, these females. Very, very good. So let me keep going on and hopefully by the time you see my face again, we will be lucky. Let's go back to South Africa to Steve Ovo. Thanks, Gigi. Good luck that side. Well, we are in the heart of Juma. I've just been following up on some alarm calls. It was a squirrel making a lot of noise. They're not the most reliable of chaps. What have you got there? Oh, that was a really big, two really big warthogs running through the gap over there. Those are the guys we saw yesterday that disappeared in us. Look at that. Monsters. They're really big. There's a little mud wallow just over here. That's a good place to check uh, for signs of animals. But we were following up on some alarm calls. Squirrels not being the most reliable of alarm calls. And then we heard a Franklin. Then we heard a couple of mongooses and a go-away bird shouting. Quang, quang. So we're just having a little look. It is that time of day. You're not expecting to see any sort of predatory animal moving. So the most most likely it's some form of, uh, of predatory bird hanging around. But uh, we're still going to check around, see if there's any tracks. This little mud wall over here is a nice nice place to check. There's a, a lone buffalo bull who's hanging around the property at the moment. I'm not sure exactly where he is, but he was seen somewhere close to here this morning. So a good place for him to be would be ensconced in the mud wallow to the right where we just had these warthogs. Let's just have a look. The mud is drying up really, really quickly. There's not much left to it. These seasonal muddy pans. 
the runoff from above the slope or from the top of the slope bringing all of the clays and nutrients down to the bottom surrounded by gory trees and the like these areas sort of dot around sort of the dry the river Rhine area and in these areas really good areas for finding all sorts of wonderful animals as this is prime habitat for Dacre, Nyala's warthog, the buffalo will come in and out and there is a lot of grass around so we're hoping uh, with the late rains that we had and possibly the lack of rain to the east that uh, we're going to be getting the buffalo herds moving in because you know what that brings that's going to bring the Unkuhuma pride and the evoker males who seem to be setting up shop in Buffalsuk to the north I can't even remember the last time we saw the Unkuhuma pride well, someone is out as well with me this afternoon. I think he's trying to follow up on some tracks of a female leopard. You know who he is. Let's go say good afternoon. I am, I am out and about and, well, this point a little on the frustrated side, which I know is early given that we've only just gotten started, but we've kind of been following on tracks and I'll explain why it's frustrating shortly. But before we get into all of that, my name is Tristan and on camera I've got Senzo this afternoon. And it is very nice to have you all aboard on a very warm, very pleasant sort of, I don't want to say summer because it feels like we're not in summer anymore. The weather is changing. So let's say autumn afternoon. Now, the frustration has come in is because there was a, we were sitting at morning meeting this morning and we heard alarm calling monkeys and squirrels and we kind of ran out of camp and Steve spotted a leopard crossing from the power lines towards sort of Gallego's side. Um, and so we came out and found the tracks and we followed the tracks and they go straight to the pan. But the problem is, is that I can't go any further because there's people that are in Gallego at the moment sitting watching the pan. And I think they're having, I mean, maybe even sun tanning. I don't know what they're doing, but they're there right where the sort of deck is close to the pan. So I can't go there for now. I have to wait until they're done. Um, so I walked around as much as I could on the sort of western side of the pan and Columba has been having an absolute blast. I say it's her because the track is quite small and she's been all over the place inside there. Pretty sure that's where the alarm calls came yesterday. Um, but none of them are from coming back this way are from today. Just her tracks going down towards the water point. Um, and then the last track I had was maybe 20 meters from where the pan is. And I had to turn around because that's the edge of the kind of thicket. So we'll have to go back there a little bit later if we are to try and track her down. Um, the thing is, is that if it is little Columba and she is kind of in one of those moods, she could be long, long gone and the alarm calls that Steve is hearing could very well be her. So we're going to try and just kind of see what we can do. Like, we're going to do a few loops further north, maybe up sort of towards Bufflesuk Dam area and then come back once the guys get mobile where we can actually properly kind of finish tracking that and see how far we get and where she is. I think she must have found some shade. Um, somewhere close to the pan. It's been a hot day today and um, you know when she, we saw her the sun had just broken through because it started off quite cloudy this morning and then just broken through and was starting to get quite warm and after a drink often leopards will go and find a place where they can just lie down and rest for the vast majority of the day. Um, so let's see. Let's see how we go. But on other leopard news it's very exciting that little well little I say little in Kanyeni um, has got a new cub that was seen for the first time today which is very very cool she's very very cute um, she's tiny 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 I say she but I don't even know if it's a boy or a girl it's too small I think to tell but super cute little thing got tiny ears and it's still very small I would probably say maybe only three four weeks old um, and so that's very exciting that there is a leopard with the cub. They are on very far east of Torchwood, so we unfortunately don't get signal where they are. Um, but cool that they're around, maybe they'll push a little bit further to the west. And given that we are going into winter months, the signal on Torchwood should start to improve a little bit as the vegetation dies back. Good. So that's the plan for the afternoon. And as we're going to do that, we're also going to bumble about and see what's kind of happening. I'm sure water holes will be the theme of the afternoon. In the meantime, though, let's send you back across to Lauren, who's had no such frustrations this afternoon and is already sitting with the tawny colored cat. So indeed, we're still at a loss of who our girl is because she really hasn't moved much at all. But we are getting different updates and the Olololos are definitely really not too far away with a zebra, I'm afraid. So that 
puts a little bit of a spanner in the works, but we're still trying, do not worry. And of course, lion prides do have home ranges and within the range, they have their territories depending on what their needs are at the time. So there will be a core central area for a lion's territory. But when I, when I think as a human, we often box things in and we think that's a territory. But of course they are dynamic and they are fluid. So the boundary lines do move from time to time. It isn't static and that is just where we're at at the moment. So my gut is telling me olololo, but I will conform. I always do. I will revert back, but that is just what my guts are telling me at the moment. So obviously lionesses do generally work as a team because it's much easier for them. So they sort of can work together. It's easier to get rid of older lions in their domain, keep hyenas at bay, which is obviously the main competition out here for lions. So it's much We're having a little bit of a roly-poly. <laughs> wow, doesn't that look extremely comfortable? Time is asking, does she have suckle marks? Very good question, because she has a huge fat belly, but I do not see any suckle marks. And obviously she just gave us a great glimpse of her belly before turning over to the other side. And I did not see any suckle marks. She does appear to be a young lioness. Sorry, that position's rather comical to me. <laughs> obviously comfortable. I don't know why that's making me laugh. There's no actually particular reason for it. This lioness has brought me many chuckles from the minute we met her. I did get a great photo of her jumping down the tree though, so I will post that soon. You can see it all in action, but she just keeps getting herself in the most amusing positions like this one right here. But it is obviously comfortable. So yes, thank you time. Great question, but I don't see suckle marks and I do think... Was that a sneeze? <laughs> oh girl, yeah, you are comical. And now we're back to pancake position. They do love their yoga lions. I don't know why that was funny, excuse me. Sometimes animals just do things that just crack me up when I actually look at them. Now, I know she's flat and it's not the most exciting thing to see, but I really want to get a better view of her better look at her face and I really want to see where she heads. I want to finish the story. So of course we are going to stay here with her, even though I'm very jealous of her at the moment sleeping like that. I really wish I could nap like I used to when I was at university, but those days are long gone. Could be the coffee, could be age, mm, most, most likely coffee. He's saying she's lying like my dog is lying on the couch. Oh, yes. My beagle would lie exactly like this as well for hours on end. And I always talk about my own made-up, non-scientific term of the biscuit tin effect. And that is, you will think your dog is absolutely snoring. She will not respond to her name or his name or not respond to any noises. But the minute you open the biscuit tin, we are awake. It's like magic. Don't know how it works. Lions are the excel. We're moving again. Lions are the exact same as with leopards, as with all the cats. You will think they're in the deepest of sleeps and they probably are, but any movement or any sound that they need to be alert to, they will jump up straight away. And I term it the biscuit tin effect, but obviously lions probably would not jump up for biscuit tins. However, it's the same effect and it is just utterly fascinating. And lions do have a terrible reputation for sleeping almost all day. Some papers give it up to 18 to 20 hours a day, which I'm sure they're absolutely capable of doing, but that's not always the case. So lions are known to hunt out here. We see it often in the Mara during the day, even under the intense midday sun, they will also hunt at night. And it just depends on what they're doing. I guess it just depends on their daily schedule. Lions can use a lot of energy on a hunt, especially a buffalo hunt that can take hours. They will expend a lot of energy. It will be very exhausting for them. Of course, they will need to recuperate and sleep at some point and that is exactly what they do especially mothers if they've got cubs yes they are exhausted and they often need to catch up on those little cat naps themselves so they can sleep most of the day but they can also be active for lots of parts of the day as well do not underestimate these lions 
and most likely <laughs> in this position is a, a new position <laughs> it looks very comfortable and she probably is not going to move for some time but we are absolutely going to stay stationary for now but you guys are going to go all the way back down to south africa to see what steve is doing well thank you lauren i think the lion has got the right idea there just taking a little bit of a chill this afternoon Probably got a very nice view and maybe a nice wind underneath being high up in the tree. We're trying to pick out some parrots over here. I can hear them calling, but I can't quite see them. The reason why I wanted to show them to you is because, um, well, they have a similar sort of nesting to uh, a lot of the, like we were talking about starlings before. I can hear them from the distance. They sound like a, a, a rusty metal gate that you open. And they are whole nesting species like the starlings as well as the uh, as the hornbills as well as the rollers or nesting in tree cavities in the woodlands of the savannah and a majority of the cavities are created by woodpeckers in their search for grubs as well as barbets creating the nesting homes Okay, well, Tristan seems to be on the way. I know everyone has let us know, or me on Twitter, that there is a leopard on the dam cam. And uh, also, to give you the news there, Tristan used the wrong comms now to tell me on the radio, Kirsty, instead of you, that he was on the way. So there we go. Tristan's in trouble for using wrong comms. I'm only joking. He's not in wrong, not in trouble. He just has to have something to drink later. So anyway, Tristan is much closer to the dam. He has been checking around Gallego for Tlalamba, while what we think was possibly Tlalamba, and well, it's a nice time of afternoon for Tlalamba to have come out to uh, have a drink, obviously. And that's why it's important for us to check watering holes. Um, it's not just birds will come down to drink, but many of your sort of prey animals will come down and drink in the middle, in the middle of the day. And sometimes you'll find leopards in the middle of the day if the heat is not too bad. Tlalamba obviously being much younger than her father, the Duke, he waits until it's very cool before he starts moving around. She's just got a bit more ants in her pants, I suppose. And also she's probably quite hungry. So we're gonna head south from here. We're just gonna poke our nose into Chitwa because it's quite warm. Have a little look-see at the dam. See if there's any elephants maybe that are popping out because it'd be wonderful to see some elephants. And then we'll see if we can follow back up on some cats. Costa, you want to know, the colors are all changing. And when will all the green be gone? Well, the grasses themselves, if there's no more rain, they are just going to get drier and drier and drier and go through a sort of dormancy stage. Uh, but if there's some rain, just like if you had to water the lawn in your house, you can keep your grass from, from going brown. Last year, we had a bit of late rain in April. Uh, but the trees as well, they will start losing their leaves as soon as the daylight sorts of reaches a certain, there's like a, a daylight limit that sort of happens and then a lot of the trees will start losing their leaves. Uh, the trees that keep their leaves are generally those that have got very good access to the water table. Um, so combination of change in daylight hours as well as um, change in water depth could potentially lead to the trees losing their leaves. So when you do find trees with lots and lots of leaves and they're still very green, it's a very good chance that that plant has got access to the water. Because essentially, if you keep your leaves on, the leaves are a pump pulling water from the bottom. But if you don't have water to pull, then the leaves are basically going to dry up uh, and they're going to cause damage to the plants. They're gonna start pulling water out of the plant that it can't afford to lose. So if you've ever run a pump dry, you can do it some serious, serious damage. And so when trees don't want to lose any more water, they drop the leaves. It's one of the things that they do out here. Okay, well, we're just going to head straight down here and see what's going on at Chitwa for a little bit. We had some nice luck there yesterday. Who knows what could happen today? In the meantime, David Gitu has found the sausage tree pride. Correct. I mean, uh, staying just close to any water hole in the African wilderness will always uh, bring some good luck. And uh, a few minutes ago, when I was telling you, hopefully when you're going to come back to me or going to see my face, we might be lucky to have 
caught up with a sausage tree pride and I have to clap for myself and we clap for all of you because we are all going to see this beautiful setting together. This is the whole family of the sausage tree pride. Well, I would say the whole family minors, of course, the boys, the males are not here, but where we are, I have counted three females and 10 cubs. And you can tell they have everything they want because the green grass behind them there has a lot of water. So if they would need to drink, that's where they'll go. They are in the shade and it's such a beautiful spot. Not sure whether that's where the cab won't go for a drink or where he's headed to. And thank you very much. I'm sure all of us will need to toast a glass of juice later in the day. Look at how, the, how green the grass is. And of course, he might be going to investigate something there and maybe bump into a frog, who knows. Now I've got three females here and this particular pride, you know, for those of you who do not know it, usually has five females. So two are not here with me and I'm sure they're somewhere. Now, one interesting thing I have to tell you, I've been here for the last, I would say, what, five, seven minutes and I'm smelling some carcass that I cannot see. The wind have settled down and to pick up the exact position of that carcass, it's very difficult. So what I've done is to stop here. I also stay in the shed, just like this cut. And slowly, if wind is going to pick up, I am going to identify where the smell of the carcass is coming from. But I'm sure there must be a kill somewhere. Well, this is very, very good news here for us in the Mara Triangle in Kenya. But I think Tristan have even better news. Well, it is good news. Today has been a good day so far already. I mean, Lauren's got her lines, David's got the sausage tree pride, and there's little Clalumba as well. She's decided to come for an afternoon drink, so thank you to all of you that let us know via the dam cam that she's around. Um, it certainly has helped us in being able to find her. The problem that we have is that there are guests in the lodge, and so I can't really follow her if she goes kind of leftwards. So we needed to kind of head up that bank towards that thicket on the other side and while she's kind of standing like that I'm actually going to try and get around quite quickly because it's difficult for me to cross to where she is now I've got to go around the other side I was hoping that she was going to drink a little while longer but it seems as though she's decided she's had enough and there's lots of squirrels shouting at her and there's going to be impalas and wildebeest that are about to also shout at her and so that's why she's going to head off in that direction but at least we've found her it's, like we were saying just now it's definitely her tracks we were following um, earlier um, it was just unfortunate that we couldn't really go because of guests otherwise I think we would have been able to track her all the way through and probably found her quite quickly but it's okay at least we have all of you guys to help us out and so it was a team effort this afternoon now, let's just quickly get across the wall um, at least she's got a tail up that's gonna make kind of following her a little bit easier from a distance um, we're just gonna go onto the road she's heading straight towards the road on the other side and from there it's gonna be probably a fairly long process to follow her around because it's quite thick <laughs> indeed James it's true she uh, Lalamba is filling the pan pet roll that Hosanna left, especially because it's a TV day today. So, I mean, you know, when we did TV last time for Nat Geo, um, we had Hosanna pretty much at the dam, most TV shows, and so she's filling that role. I was saying that, I'm sure a few weeks ago we were talking about this, and I was saying that I'm sure Clalamba is going to be here a lot this winter, given how dry it is. And so hopefully that's going to be the case. Hopefully mom doesn't push her away and we get to spend lots and lots of time with the little princess over the course of the next few months. Particularly if she's going to be at the dam camp, wouldn't that be nice? Now she should be here. I'll just work out exactly where she came. She might have just gone and lay in one of these quarry thickets, given how hot it is. I mean, she's had a really nice drink. She's not extremely full, which means she's not going to a meal. Um, but she should be somewhere here. So the sense is saying to me she came between that thicket. We've got impalas right here, so they're going to help us. If she moves past us, you know, the impalas will start to shout and they'll make a lot of noise, which will be able to help us find her. But I think she's probably lying in one of these thickets here, given how hot it is today. There's the edge of the water, Sen, so she came here somewhere. 
Where are you, little Clalumba? I think she must be inside here, Sense. Mm, there's a squirrel alarming. I'm just trying to see where she's gone. Like I say, the impalas behind us will help us because if she moves in that direction, then we should be able to kind of see her. Did she come this way, Sense? She did, eh? Straight here. Okay, so she must be here somewhere. I just got to find her. She's in one of these little thickets, I would imagine. Where did you go, little Clalumba? It's amazing how you can be right here and can't even see them. Gives you an idea. She's still walking, okay. So, I believe. Okay, so she's still walking towards the drainage. Then... Uh, there's the impalas are shouting now. So, have they seen her? Yes, they have. There she is there. Okay. So, we kind of have where she is now, which is good. The impalas are barking, which it helps us be able to find where she is. Oh, there she is. Clalumba, you are moving far too quickly for your own good here. So, she's straight in front of us now, so at least we've got a view of her, which will help us. Yes, yes, Impalas, we know. Well done, you saw her. Clever Impalas. It's going to try and avoid all the little Tamburtis inside here. We don't drive over them. Of course, Clalumba has taken the most difficult route through here. She couldn't have just gone up towards the road, could she? Still see her, Sense. Last time I saw her, I was walking here. Oh, there she is there. Okay. All right. Like I said, this should be an interesting story because it's going to be thick, it's going to be dense, it's going to be difficult. And so while we try and catch up with her, let's send you back across to the cute little sausage overload that is in the Mara. Tristan, I trust you very much, and I'm sure Talamba is not going anywhere because you're going to catch up with her pretty soon. Me, I'm having a ball, I'm having fun because my cats are not going anywhere, and I do not see them going anywhere for some three good reasons. Number one, they're in the shade. No cats will want to move out in the heat of the day unless they do have to. Two, as you, have, you can see the green grass behind them, that's a natural spring, and there's a lot of water to drink from. And of course, number three, as I said earlier, I can still, you know, smell the carcass. I can't see it as yet. I've tried to reposition myself. I'm putting my nose out. I'm sure you have seen how lions or how some of the animals, when they're doing what you call grimacing, and they put their noses up just to smell the fertility sometimes of the females. That's what me and Bunge are doing, and we've been doing that for the last uh, couple of minutes. We have not been able to know exactly where that carcass is, but I'm convinced it is somewhere. Now, this particular plant have a nursery school, a nursery school of different ages. We got about 11 cubs. Kirkin are asking, why are they sleeping? Well, it's rather hot here. When we started, it was mid 80s. Uh, that is Fahrenheit and very high is a centigrade. We are talking of about almost 30 degrees Celsius. That is too hot. Many cats, many cats, I'm talking of lions, cheetahs, leopards, jaguars. In general, when it's hot, they want to stay in the shade. Now, lions, because they do not climb trees like leopards, they'll always choose a place like this. But also, let's look at the bellies. You can tell the bellies are full. They have had some good eat. And of course, if you're full, you have drunk enough water to quench your thirst or to digest the protein they have eaten, what is the next thing you do? For lions, it is typical just to go flat. But look at the cubs, up and down, pretty active, and still showing they are not ready to nap just like the adults. Now, this play, pride have got two males. I've got two pride males that we call the Ondonyo Pike. I haven't seen them. I do not know where they are. And there's one cub there. You see, I guess he's just being curious and trying to be different from the others. Hello there. 
I'm trying to bite some st uh, sticks to strengthen your teeth, maybe, or strengthen your muscles, possibly. Are you trying? Well, everybody, sorry about the technical issues you're experiencing there. We've popped on to Chitra to come down to the watering hole, of course, and a look at what has mysteriously appeared in front of us. It looks like possibly the Unkuhuma Pride, but I'm not 100% sure. I'm trying to get some nice identification features. There's at least two young males, possibly even three young males, which is a little bit strange. But they are looking very, very full. Very full indeed. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and ten of them. And well, they've eaten quite well and they are very hot and very uncomfortable in the, this afternoon sunshine. And some of them are sporting very black lips from um, drinking the very muddied water that is now what remains of Chitwa Watering Hole. So you see, there's a young male. He looks like the normal Unkuhuma young male. But then there's another one off to the left, which also, I'm not sure, everybody. We're gonna get a closer look at these individuals and see if we can find some characteristic features. Um, I thought on the left there, you can see one young male and there's another one in front. That's definitely a male. And you see by the neck. And then that seems to be, a, just by the look of it, I thought it was the Mangeni male, but I haven't been able to see under the tail yet. Maybe I'm confused completely, but we've just arrived in the sighting. Uh, that individual that we were looking at looks like it was lying in all sorts of weird, wet stomach content or something. Oh, in fact, that looks like a lady. That is one of the old girls. That just, she looks very scraggly. She's been lying in either the water or in the stomach content of some sorts really don't know hopefully it's water because i'm sure if any of you've ever come across stomach content it doesn't smell very good at all at all owed to stomach content as hukumuri did the other day with the buffalo dung he liked to mask his very smelly smelly smelliness of himself okay so i'm guessing it's Unkuhuma pride just from what i can see but i don't recognize that one male the mangeni male has normally got a very characteristic sort of face to him what did you see, Darby? Oh, the water buck is water buck suddenly realized that there's something over here. The wind is wafting over to them in that direction. Okay, so yeah, this one. Okay, that is the oldest lioness. So, very good. There she is with that very badly injured hip. And still, it's looking in much better, much better condition than it was all those many, many months ago. So everyone is confirming that is the Nkuhuma Pride. And now when you see this hip of this female, it's always a very easy way to identify the pride. Sometimes there's some other characteristic features, but it always takes me just a few more minutes to do so. Well, very good. It seems like we've all found ourselves some cats this afternoon. And these guys are enjoying a very nice bit of shade provided here on the side of Chitra Watering Hole, provided by a very nice big jackalberry. Well, it seems like surprises are on the offing today, and Tristan has got another one. It indeed is very surprising because our beautiful little girl, who you can see has found herself some shade, has given us a really big surprise in the form of a really big meal. Now, in the background there, you will notice there is a fully grown male impala that seems to be her kill. Now, I went past the impala. We spotted it just as she was kind of approaching, and it does look like it's got bite marks on the neck. So I s assume that she managed to bring this down all on her own, which would make it the biggest kill that we know of that she's managed to bring down. There's no other sign of any other leopards here, um, and the fact that it's got bite marks on the neck tends to suggest she didn't just find it dead. So it's a fully grown male impala, which is a huge, 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 huge meal and milestone for little Clalamba. Now, whether or not she's going to be able to keep it, I highly doubt. 
I'm almost 99% sure that she's going to lose it to hyenas um, at some point this evening. But isn't it incredible that our little princess is starting to really grow up and is managing to catch things the size of adult male impalas? It's a huge, huge meal for her. Well done, girl. No wonder you hot and bothered. So the fact that she kind of walked sort of back in this direction tended to suggest that maybe she had some sort of a meal. I wasn't sure, but I was thinking there could be something around here. Um, but the fact that she's brought something of that size down is quite something. And I know a lot of you are saying, wow, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? She really has kind of stepped up and managed to find something incredible so i'm super happy for her i'm glad that she's managed to get a nice big meal hopefully and i know i say this in in a kind of bad way well as maybe some of you might say it in a bad way but i actually hope tingana arrives um and i tell you why and shaks you just referring to this is that you say this is tingana and hyena bait um and exactly i actually wouldn't mind tingana arriving because he would have the strength to hoist this and you'll find that he'll kind of eat and he'll keep plalamba at bay for a while but eventually she'll actually get a meal out of it far more than if the hyenas arrive the hyenas are going to bully her off this in two seconds and completely chomp that down um last night we had so many hyenas moving around in this area and who knows maybe you know she's been losing kills in the last few days because our hyenas look as though they have been kind of put on a sausage machine and been force fed huge chunks of meat because they've all been fat and full over the last two days and we haven't really been finding carcasses so I wonder if maybe little Clalamba hasn't been feeding the resident hyena population and so it would be good for her to have little Tingana, well not little, big Tingana arrive to be able to hoist it into a tree for her to be able to get some f sort of food out of it at some point or she's going to have to learn what her brother learnt um, in the form of being patient and waiting for a scrap or something for the hyenas to leave behind and then grab that and take it up a tree. The problem is, is where it is at the moment really is not anywhere near a nice tree for her to hoist. Um, these are all tiny little trees that are around her and it's going to be very difficult for her to drag this really anywhere. I mean, that kill probably weighs more than she does, almost double what she does, actually, if you think about it. So she's got a lot of kind of work to do to be able to actually move it. She's eaten a little bit, um, not a huge amount as yet. So I'm hoping that at least tonight she'll get a really good kind of feed um, out of it before she sort of loses it if the hyenas do come and, and they do sort of get to this point. The other problem that she's got, unfortunately, is that where we situated is right next to a road. We're within... I don't know, 15 meters of a road. And we know that the hyenas like to use roads um, as they move around in the sort of, um, in the evenings. So they're gonna come up and down these roads and for them, they're going to be able to spot that really quickly. You can see kind of where the road is behind me. So this is the road that runs and always the hyenas are gonna move around from here, given that we have a dam behind us over there and there's another dam straight up this road on Biffle's Hook. So it's kind of a thoroughfare for many animals that walk along here. And, the chances of her being able to actually keep that is going to be quite slim but i'm super impressed i mean it's a serious serious meal for any leopard to bring down um and so she's done super well and as she gets a little bit older in life we're going to find that she's going to perfect the art of killing these guys and eventually will get strong enough to be able to put them in the tree now this little cat is going to probably have a really good nap and rightly so she's obviously been busy through the course of today what have you seen girl don't see anything behind us. But anyway, she's going to have a bit of a nap. In the meantime, though, let's send you across to Steve and the Inkuma Pride who are doing much the same. Welcome back to Chitwe, everybody, where it pays off to check the watering holes. Just as you, some of you, spotted Tlalamba on the dam camp. Tristan was able to find her and well we've managed to find the Uncle Pride and just chatting with someone on the radio and it seems that the Uncle Pride ate a young giraffe sometime this morning so and it wasn't here it was a little bit further away but obviously they've come here for drinking very very good well they say the sign of independence for a leopard is the ability to fully kill and take down a male impala and well, Salamba has done that. It's not her first male in parlor that she's caught, but the sure sign of being independent is then being able to, on your own, hoist that animal into a tree so as to secure your food resource. Because no doubt in the first few male in parlor that Salamba catches, she's probably going to lose them to either her dad or to hyenas. 
who no doubt will follow her around. They can smell her. They know exactly who she is. Well, this is great. We've got a couple of the young lions walking around. The oldest lioness, Darby, is right at the back there, busy having a drink. Don't know why she walked all that way to go and have a drink. She's looking very, very full. Some space for water. We thought maybe they were all going to start leaving because two got up and started walking off. Let's come back into the shade. This is the only real shade to be found. <laughs> Look, Carmilla. You want to know how tall a lion is if it stands on its hind legs? Well, I'm going to have to just double check that for you. Now, there's definitely a measurement in my book that gives me sort of a the head to tail of a lion. I'm just going to double check it so that I don't make a wrong mis I don't say it wrong here for you because it's important that the information we give you is accurate. But I've seen photos of lions standing with their hands on the shoulders of people and they stand taller than a human. Um, but obviously it's difficult to say exactly how big they are because obviously people come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. But lions, for the most part, are pretty much the same sort of size. So I'm just going to double check in my book here for you, Carmela. V67. One second. Okay, so average height, 120 centimeters. But that's from the shoulder. That's from the, the ground up onto the shoulder. So that is not, it's not in this book. Uh, my other book definitely has got a sh oh maybe not but lots of different resources to check the actual length of an animal and I'll give me one more second okay so shoulder height doesn't actually give it to you in this book so definitely a lion standing on my shoulders on its hind quarters and its legs extended with its paws on my shoulders would stand taller than I would um, so more than six feet um, they're very very big um, and it's they are very very powerful and so a lion that could stand taller than me and weighs twice my weight you can imagine what they can do running at enormous speeds jumping onto very very big prey animals She is a very thirsty girl. And although the Unkuhumas are looking a little bit active right now, I think it's mainly got to do with just the fact that their belly is very full. They are water buck abounding in the surrounding areas. They all have an idea, I think, that the lions are here. I don't perceive them getting too close. There's one on the dam wall itself off to the left there. That's spotted these lions and it wants to come down and drink we saw the kudu yesterday coming down to drink and they were a little bit tentative i don't know where the Nkuhumas have come from in the night because where we found their tracks just now was just up the road here on the way into chitwa from the main road gauri main where we come from but where they came from it's very hard to say lions will walk quite large distances in search of food and then they can spend a few days in that place once they have caught something just for digestion and for catching up on some much needed sleep. Well, Lauren had some interesting interaction not so long ago with a giraffe and a dead baby. I think she's got a live, fully grown one in this time. Let's go see if there's any drama unfolding that side. Yes, I do. These giraffes are very, very close to me right now. We have four female giraffes that are just absolutely stunning. They were actually on, on the road, so we had to stop. And it's definitely worth stopping for. There's just giraffes everywhere right now. I don't really know why I'm whispering, because I don't have to. They're more than relaxed with us here. But it's just... oh. 
It's just wonderful to stop. We're having so much luck with cats today. We are actually on our way to other cats, which is why we did leave our very sleepy lioness. But don't worry, we will return back to her because I don't think she's going anywhere for some time. But we just thought we would stop and appreciate these absolutely gorgeous animals. Now, I was reading, I, I've spoke about their spot pattern. It's difficult when I say spot pattern because it's not really spots, but that is what they call it when they refer to the patches. I guess you could say patches pattern. Actually, the calves, whether they're male or female, inherit part of their spot pattern from their mothers. Not the entire thing, but they inherit quite a large part of the pattern of patches, spot pattern, from their mothers. So they will have an identical area on their body that's exactly the same as their mothers. Isn't that incredible? Now they're really close to us like now. Sometimes giraffes can get a bit nervous with the cars, but these ones are just completely relaxed and quite happy happily feeding, might I add. Oh, my father's favourite animal is giraffe. We grew up with giraffe paintings and giraffe ornaments all around the house. And I think I can finally admit that I see what he's talking about. Giraffe girls seen the belly on that one. Yes, actually, quite a few of them have huge bellies. And there's one at the back. And of course, our view is completely blocked now. The third one in that row of three, her belly is so swollen, I'm beginning to wonder if there's a pregnancy there. Two of them have huge, huge, huge bellies. And giraffes can eat. They're said to eat up to about 34 kilograms of leaves and foliage per day. Now that is about just over 70 pounds I think that was my attempt at quick maths in my head so they eat a lot of course look at the size of them they will need to eat a lot <laughs> and you can get a glimpse of that black tongue there just as they're eating it's extraordinarily striking when you see an animal of this coloration and it's pure black tongue which contains so much melanin which was thought to originally protect the giraffe from the sun of course our skin has melanin in it as well but it's probably just used more to make the tongue more rubbery if you like the melanin itself will make the, tur the tongue turn black it'll be thicker stronger and more rubbery in nature which will indeed protect it when eating sort of shrubs and bushes with thorns or anything like that but a lot, a lot of the theories do go that it is to protect it from the sun. But I personally, and this is just my personal opinion, I definitely don't buy that one. Eddie's saying they're such graceful creatures and oh, they really, really are. And although, you know, they do tend to walk quite slowly, they can gallop up to quite extraordinary speeds when they want to. It takes them a little while to get going. They're not the fastest animals to get going. But once they really get into that gallop, they can go at anywhere between 50 to 60 kilometers per hour, which is quite extraordinary for this animal. And they really only have two sort of movements, two gates. It's either walking or galloping. They're not really able to do much other than that. But let alone, they're just fantastic. And if, our, if James is able to give us a beautiful view of this one from behind, you're able to see the way the legs come in at the knees. Now, in humans, I think you would maybe refer to that. Okay, it's off again. <laughs> I swear the animals know what we're saying. Maybe this one would be good, James, this one here. So you can see the knees bend in, and in humans, a condition like that, I guess, would maybe be called knock knees or something like that. Something along the lines of that. And the reason the giraffe is structured like that is because it very regularly puts its knees together in squats position. So when it needs to bend down for food, bend down for water, and of course with females when they are given birth. So that is why the legs do taper in like that and it almost has a knock knees effect. Hello beautiful, look at your ossicones. They're lovely and unusual. <laughs> Aren't they quite unusual? They're almost joining in the middle there. I don't know if it's just the way the wind is blowing the fluff, if you like, or if they are actually bending in towards one another. Either way, it's stunning. 
Now, I think our giraffes are very soon going to move off. And we, of course, have a mission. We are going to look for more lions. I won't ruin the surprise just yet, but we are on a mission. And while we do that, we will send you over to David, who actually does have his little sausages. I am sure, I am sure, you know, Lauren will be getting possibly more lions. As I said earlier, that territory she is in, she has a possibility of either getting the Ololos or the Owino Pride. And having said Ololos, that has reminded me that I still got some work to do on my song uh, to console the Ololo Pride after they lost uh, some cabs a few weeks ago. Well, my lions haven't done much, but I have now vaguely been able to identify where the carcass is coming from. Not very far from where we are, I was able, wow, well, that's a nice play there between one big boy cub and that youngster there. I've been able to have an idea that it's coming from my right hand side. Not exactly that I have seen it, but after listening or just smelling carefully, not even listening from the wind, I have been able to know where the smell is coming from. My guess is that or this is a buffalo that these lions brought down. And my guess is it could be two days ago or three days which would translate to them being here for the next three days which is all very good news for me the whole pride is about nine days going to ten since i last saw them but three days ago i was very lucky to see some of the cubs on top of a tree that we call the buchanani tree now if they're full they have had enough to drink the only movement you see is twitching their ears just because of the little disturbances or irritation from the flies. Apart from that, sleep, snooze, and maybe dream. And maybe not sure or know what they could be dreaming about. Now, the male hasn't come to join them. And what I'd want to do maybe at one point is to try and confirm whether that kill is and find out if the other two females that are not here are there. Now, this pride, the last we had a count, we counted me and Bungay, 11 cubs, and uh, Bungay is the camera operator with me. Uh, I'm sure now Tristan has been able to catch up with Talamba. Let's find out the latest. Of course we have, we haven't had to go to very far, but she's now feeding on the carcass, which is, in some ways quite entertaining because look at how little she is next to the size of this impala it gives you an idea of just how big this meal is and there really is going to be zero chance of her hoisting this into a tree when you see her standing next to it you realize just how much bigger this impala is than what she is at the moment but good on her for managing to somehow pull this down i'm trying to see if there's many like sort of struggle marks and and things like that and it looks like there are a few sort of hooves and things like that, but it doesn't look too bad. Be quite keen to go around the other side and have a little check properly to see what's going on. But either way, she's going to tuck in and have a really good feed now. And she's going to try and probably get those innards out. You can see it's fresh, fresh, fresh. She's just starting to open it up now. Now, Nancy, how would she get that up a tree? Well, Brute force is part of it. I mean, a leopard is an incredibly strong animal, but essentially what she would have to do is, if she had any chance of this being taken up a tree, she would have to get every bit of those internal organs out, um, completely disembowel this animal, and then she would have to grab it by the sort of throat and then sort of have a, I would imagine a tree Oh, how would she have killed it? Sorry, not how would she get it up a tree. Well, how would she have killed it? Quite simple. She would have lay in the bush waiting, and then as the impala came past, she would have um, jumped onto it, grabbed it, and tried to get her f mouth either around the throat or over the nose, and then hung on for dear life, basically. <laughs> That's the only way to do it. And eventually, the, the sort of strength of well, this cat just clawing and holding on and then just hanging by that throat um the impala gets more and more exhausted and and you know she can then start to suffocate it but it would have been a, a massive struggle for her to be able to to bring this down properly um she would have probably got dragged around quite a bit at first often what will happen when 
antelope of this size get taken by smaller predators, and you see it a lot with cheetah, um, is that the animal almost locks its legs. So the antelope kind of goes into this leg lock, and they kind of spread their legs as though they don't want to fall, and they try and kind of pull their neck away from the predator to try and kind of somehow slip out and then run. But um, if the predators can get their claws in and can get their teeth in, then generally they have enough strength to hold on, and then it's just a game of waiting it out and waiting for this animal to die. What surprises me with this is that when an impala gets killed, it's not in a quiet affair. And not so much from the impala that is dying or dead, um, it is from the rest of the impalas that are in the area. They generally go absolutely crazy when one of their own is grabbed and the alarm call lasts for that much longer. And I don't recall hearing any alarm calls today of impalas and we're not far from the lodge at all. Um, but maybe I missed it. Maybe we just didn't hear it because of the wind or something like that. I don't know. But um, either way, she's really done well and I'm super, super impressed with her. It's a serious meal for any leopard, let alone a leopard of a year and a half who's her size. You know, she's still got a lot of growing to do, but it is a kind of proud moment when you see them with these bigger kills. Now, her mom is a leopard that has brought down many an antelope that is far too big for her. Um, I mean, you can see even when she's pulling with all her might, <laughs> that carcass is not going anywhere. So <laughs> she's going to have to do a lot of work to kill it to get this kind of eaten down to the point where she could actually put it somewhere. Um, but her mom was is a leopard that has brought down her fair share of rather large items, as well as her brother Tumba. He's managed to bring down kudu, um, young kudus, and you know Tandi. She I've seen her bring down a fully grown kudu cow, which is massive as well and probably a bit kind of relative in size to what we're seeing here so she comes from good stock and eventually like i say when she's a sort of you know prime this is going to be well, par for the course she'll be going after many of these male impalas particularly this time of the year as the rut starts we know that the rut should be starting and, and, and already we're seeing sort of signs of male impala chasing one another and i wouldn't be surprised that's what's happened here as this was purely opportunistic she probably was lying down in the shade and just resting and impalas came past and she just grabbed one and was able to kind of pull it down is what my guess is with this but we'll see. I mean, it's very, very fresh still. There's no smell whatsoever from this impala. So it's not something that's died yesterday or this morning and has been baked in the sun for long. She must have killed it fairly sort of recently this afternoon. There's lots of hoof tracks from where they were running close to me here. I'm just looking in the sand next to the car. Um, so maybe they came, came running through chasing each other and she managed to then grab it and has started to feed. Epic though, isn't it? Amazing the strength in such a small cat. Often we kind of think about how strong wild animals are. So a lot of your stress that hyenas are going to come in shortly. Well, no, not now. It's too hot. There's very few hyenas that will be moving around right now. But come sort of six o'clock, we're going to start to see hyenas coming. And no doubt they will take it. But remember when there's a carcass, hyenas are actually not too worried about the leopard. They'll run in and they'll grab the carcass and they'll start to feed. And we've seen it countless times with leopards when hyenas rob them is they'll come in, they'll feed, they'll chomp and, and eat as quick as possible. And hopefully what's going to happen in this scenario is it's not going to be one of the big girls that arrives here. So it's not going to be a pretty or a corky that comes here. Hopefully it's one of the boys like Saka who will have a feed and they'll eat until they cannot eat anymore and they become like little barrels. And then sometimes they'll walk away and that will allow Klalamba to come in and grab whatever's left. And that's normally kind of some of the carcass, which is basically probably what we want is we want her to have the ability to actually have some sort of bit of carcass i mean this is just way too big for her to to hold on to no matter what happens here even if it's tomorrow hyenas will find her um and take it away unless of course her dad arrives which is also always possible he lurks around these areas quite regularly and so maybe he'll come in and be able to take it and i wouldn't be surprised if the hyenas do come in the commotion he arrives too but look at the size of that paw isn't that cool it's got a kind of toes all spread, massive. Florian, she's not only eating the skin, you see she's just broken through the skin now um, to start feeding on the meat over the rib areas. Um, and what you'll find is she's going to open that kind of cavity out. And so she's eating, there's a sort of membrane that runs between the skin and the meat. And then there's a sort of belly section. And once she opens that, she can then start to pull out that stomach area 
and get rid of all of that stomach content which will be fermenting heavily inside then starting to expand and swell and then she can kind of get rid of that and get to the choice sort of organs inside there um, so it's very common to see a leopard start like this where they kind of open up a flap along the rib section and the belly area and then they kind of go down towards between the legs and she has actually eaten from the rump already it's difficult to see the way that she is at the moment but there is a little section of the rump, the tail area, where she's actually eaten away um, at some of that now. So I think she's just trying to create a hole and then try and kind of get rid of any of those internal organs, which is, I suppose, good. Um, sometimes they also just like to eat a certain section and they, they go for it from there. You might find she's also struggling a little bit to move the carcass around, and so this is just the easiest spot for her to be able to actually feed and put sort of sustenance in. And that means that, you know, she's able to actually kind of get some food from there rather than fighting with trying to roll the carcass and get between the legs and all those kind of things um, if she wanted to feed off the sort of rump area. Or she could just be in that kind of mood where she just feels like ribs. You never know. The good thing though, which is nice, is that all the alarm calls have stopped. So there's no longer squirrels shouting at her, no longer birds which is going to be vitally important. The longer that there's no alarm call in this immediate vicinity, the better it is for her to be able to keep it, or the longer she'll be able to keep it. Oh, she got herself a rib. It didn't last long. Well done, girl. She looks quite smitten with herself, doesn't she? Quite on edge, though, as well, and I suspect that she knows at some point there's going to be um, hyenas coming, and so she any sort of noise or movement as you see her kind of whip around and, and look and check what's going on. Well, we're going to stay and see what happens. I'm sure it's going to be an entertaining evening with our little princess. Um, and so while we wait, let's send you across to the Inkuhuma Pride who have already feasted like she is now and are now sleeping away their hard-earned meal. Thing, or you've got too much chocolate than you think you can deal with. And every time you hear a noise, you think it's someone bigger than you coming to steal it. <laughs> That's what's going on. She's caught more than she can deal with, but she still wants to have as much of it as she possibly can. Well, that oldest lioness was drinking for the longest time. Um, I don't know why she took so long to drink. I didn't think there would be any space. And now this other youngster has gone down to drink. They're much closer than what the other one went to. This is just down the path from where all the lions are lying down. And well, they are looking very uncomfortable, everybody. There's all sorts of panting going on here as the diaphragm is pushed up as high up as it can into the chest cavity by their very full uh, belly of baby giraffe. And what a treat. The guests of Chitwa Lodge can just look over a hundred yards or so and they can see the lions on the other side of the watering hole from them. This is wild country everybody and if the hippos in the watering hole didn't say it enough for you a pride of lions sleeping on the other side surely will don't forget everybody we are live and interactive would love to hear from you this wonderful sunday afternoon from wherever you are in the world send through your questions and comments hashtag safari live or throw them in on the youtube chat stream bearing in mind i'm focusing on lions at the moment so if you have any questions pertaining to the unkuhuma pride send them through to me MGN, you want to know a very important poo story, and indeed, hippos actually defecate in the water. Um, there's a couple other animals as well, birds and fish will defecate in the water, and essentially, you want to know if that affects the predators, and I don't think it would at all. Uh, what the poo does do is it increases the nutrient component in the water, which can quite often lead to buildups of algae, which quite often take out the oxygen in the water and can lead to a bit of a fish die off. It doesn't necessarily make the water toxic for other animals to drink, uh, but it necessarily just takes the oxygen out, which is important for the fish. Albeit you find it quite strange that water's got oxygen in it. It does indeed. Um, and 
If you had gills, you'd be able to breathe under the water. Um, but with watering holes and with rivers, the movement of water is quite important. But the problem is, is in a watering hole like this, there's no exit plan for the water. The water just gets lower and lower. So decreasing in, in uh, density, decreasing in, in the amount of it. And with the increase in hippo um, organic material in there, there will be an increase in the chemicals as well as a decrease in the oxygen an increase in the nutrients which what happened last year with Tangana came he was feasting off of the fish so he would have fed off a fish that would have probably starved of oxygen oxygen starvation but they wouldn't have been poisonous for him to eat but it is tricky there are lots and lots of things that can go on with water as well but naturally out here hippos are actually an important sort of driving force in the ecosystem but unfortunately when you get watching holes that starts to get very very low and dry out that increase in organic material can offers often have the opposite effect. Well, that lioness has had her fill and she's now come back to rest her head on her pillow. Mm, okay, so everybody wants some updates on the Unkohuma cubs and well, just having a look at the lionesses here, I haven't yet been able to identify amber eyes amongst this group. So we've definitely had the oldest lioness. We've got the two young males, the Mangani male, as well as the one Unkuhuma male. The lioness that flopped down there is one of the youngsters. She's got no mammary glands visible. There's another one there that's hanging on to the male. She's got some mammary glands, but not really visible. The one off to the right, I think that is not the oldest one on the far right there, Darby. She's the only one with any sort of visible mammary, the one on the right more. A little bit more, that one there's the only one who's actually physically got any sort of mammary gland growth at the moment, but there's no suckle marks and it's very hard to tell because their bellies are so swollen from food that if there were cubs inside there, it'd be very hard to, oh, sorry, Darby, look at this young male over here the inside of his leg yeah there we go kind of in the middle of your shot now inside of his leg there is a very nasty looking wound over there ow now that could have come from a buffalo horn uh, from another lion's claw very hard to say but ow that doesn't make me feel very happy it looks very painful and that is the Mangani male, as far as I'm aware. I saw his face earlier. Or is this the Mangani male now? They swapped around, I think. I'm getting very confused. The Mangani male has got a little bit of a longer face. And when they're looking at you, it's quite easy to identify the difference between the two males. Um, but the Mangani male has recovered an enormous amount of condition. His, even his tail has grown back. So unless they both sit up and look at me, I find it quite tricky at the moment to identify the two of them. They both got a very similar development of the mane. So I can't tell you for certain right now. I think that might be the Unkuhuma young male right there. But we will keep watching. When he lifts his head, I'll be able to confirm it for you. Um, but when it comes to cubs of the pride, um, I don't know. We haven't seen them in... I haven't seen the Unkuhumas in ages now. Where they've been, they've been wandering, meandering all over the place. There hasn't been any reports that I've heard of of them having any cubs. They were most certainly mating when I came back in December and January. So we've got the oldest lioness, it's one. And then we've got another one there, it's two. I haven't seen the one with the purple eye yet. So there's at least two adults here, possibly three. And I don't think one of them is amber eyes. So I know that the purple eyed lioness was mating. I haven't seen her here yet, um, but very tricky. She's got to actually open her eyes and look at me to be able to see that. But the youngsters are all melting into the adults. They're all getting quite big. They're all looking the same sort of size. <laughs> Project Alpha, you said the lions have found the beach of the migration to ambush. Well, I don't know what animals would come close to them right now, but um, definitely there is the potential for someone to sneak up on them. The water buck. The... 
Beach Boys. Beach Ball. Beach Ball. Oh, indeed. They have indeed eaten all of the Beach Balls. <laughs> Their bellies are very, very round. I'm sorry I didn't get your joke there, Project Alpha. I do apologize. Please do forgive me. <laughs> I was thinking to Dave earlier, um, because the one old lioness came and sat down right in front of us. She's got such a bulge of a belly. I was wondering if it is, would be possible to just like sort of squeeze it and where it would go. Would it come out or would it come out the mouth or would you be able to actually... <laughs> Has a lion ever eaten another lion to try and access the food in their belly? I mean, there's so much meat in there. There's an entire animal, it seems, inside a lion's belly that it would be an easy sort of thing to do, wouldn't it? If you're a big male lion and you wanted food, just beat up another one and steal the food from them steal the beach ball from their belly. Well, an animal who by the end of today is going to have a belly twice the size of the Unkuhuma pride once she's finished her male and parlor, or at least had a piece of it. Let's go and see how much Kalamba is loving her meal. Well, Kalamba certainly will have a belly probably three times the size if she manages to consume all of this. It's nice now that she's actually turned it so we can see the kind of face of the impala, which is probably a good indication of how she actually killed it so when i first saw it on the neck i thought there was blood but it was just a shadow but if you actually look on the nose of the impala you'll see that's where she must have grabbed it because the nose itself is completely kind of chewed up in some respects and you can actually see the bite marks where she put, got her f muzzle over the muzzle of the impala itself and then must have just hung on for dear life from there and eventually that would have suffocated this impala to falling over and and kind of dying from there so that's how she's killed it is not by the neck she managed to get it by the nose instead which is good it's a good technique i often do do it and a lot of leopards will use that technique because it's much quieter the animal doesn't make nearly as much noise if they can get it around the muzzle now she has eaten through kind of the rib area and and exposed those inner um organs and there was quite a lot of sound and things which is probably quite good that we went on here because it was a bit sort of I don't know what the word is a bit rough i suppose in some respects it's not very nice when you hear all of those squishy sounds as the kind of internal organs start spilling out of the impala which is a bit on the macabre side so nice that she's already done it and you don't have to witness all of that and she's now slowly but surely kind of just going through the ribs you can see she's sort of battling with it and she managed to drag it a little bit where she's kind of turned it um, and i'm sure she's a lot happier to feed where she is now because not quite as much in the sun as she was to start with. Kathy, I've never seen them use their claws to tear open a carcass on purpose. So I have seen hunts where lions and, and leopards have grabbed an animal and in the process of struggling, they've kicked with their back legs or grabbed with their front legs and the speed of the animal causes a massive rip to take place. And we see it sometimes with things like zebra, uh, we had that really bad zebra injury here that looked like lions um so you know we have you, you kind of see that more than anything else but in potentially to open a carcass no i've never seen it it's not like they kind of flick a claw out and then they surgically cut it open um that was something that is reserved for disney i'm afraid um out here it's it's the canines that do pretty much all of the work the the paws and the claws generally are grip to be able to pull it and open it and shift it and move it and then from there they'll be able to feed on it but you see how wary she is she's definitely learned that feeding and, and having her head down causes noise and she needs to be a lot more kind of careful when she's on a carcass that's all traits that she would have learned in time when she was with her um, mother and feeding on all the various carcasses and since she's been independent she probably would have learned it even more so given that she i'm 99.9 .9 sure she's been robbed a few times by our resident hyena population and so she will be learning valuable lessons all the time when this happens and the fact that she's killing big animals like this is means that those are only going to happen more and more and eventually it will drive her to learn how to hoist kills but i'm afraid this is just too big and too heavy for her she's got no chance i mean we watched hosana struggle with something of the size and he was double um, if not triple the sort of weight that she is i mean maybe not triple but definitely double the weight she is and he struggled with big animals like this so you know, she's got a long way to go before she's ever going to be able to hoist that up into a tree. Impressive, though. Either way, to be able to bring it down is still pretty impressive, and it bodes well for the future of little Kalamba and her sort of part that she's going to play in the Sabi Sand leopard legacies that we have out here. 
what a bit of her grandmother and her mother in her if she's able to bring down animals like this. And basically what she's doing is she's just kind of slowly but surely just breaking open more and more of that sort of cavity. Um, you can hear a little bit in the distance, it might be a bit tricky to hear, but you can hear it crunching the skin every now and then and eventually that's going to open up far enough for the stomach to come out. So you see the stomach is starting to expand and swell out through that rib cage. So eventually it will be broken far enough that that will come out and be easily pullable and she can just kind of grab it and squish it off to the side and be able to actually kind of um, get rid of all of that and open that carcass out properly. Amazing how surgically they do it. So you would think that her kind of eating like she was earlier it looked like she was just kind of eating off the rib section, but you can see how it's exposed that stomach area. And so if you are squeamish, probably not a good time to be looking, but all of that behind her head is the internal organs and that fourth chambered stomach that we know um, ruminate, or ruminating animals have. So that's all gonna expand and kind of be able to be pulled out from there. You might find she'll go after a few of those organs now. I, I think though she's more trying to open it further so that it's easier to actually get rid of all of that stuff. And then you'll find that they start to eat the sort of kidneys and the heart and the liver. Those are all firm favorites of most cats. So we'll see if she actually gets tucked into those. And it's amazing to watch this kind of feeding process compared to lions and, and wild dogs. Um, wild dogs, this would have been long gone by now. And the lions too. If the Nkuma pride came across this impala, the way they would have eaten it would have just been, everybody would have run in and there would have just been pieces going all over the place and it would have, to have lasted more than sort of five minutes or so. Whereas, you know, for her, if she could keep this, would be a, probably a three to four day meal. So it gives you an idea of just how much more methodical and how much more kind of careful leopards are when they feed in comparison to other predators that we get out here. Same with hyenas, they'll also destroy this carcass in a few minutes. It's not going to take long if a few hyenas arrive here. Very cool though. It's one of those proud moments that you have when you've been watching a leopard for quite some time and you always think what's the biggest animal she can kill and we obviously speculate and we don't know but this is the first real evidence that we've got of her bringing down a fully grown male impala. I don't think we've seen her feeding on a fully grown male impala by herself, have we? I know we've seen her with a fully grown female impala when she was quite young, which we thought maybe died of natural causes. But this, as far as I know, is the first fully grown male impala we found her with by herself. I might be mistaken, but I think it is. Firefly, you say you guess the days of worrying about her independence is over. Well, not necessarily, um, and the reason why is that she's still young. I mean, she's not a territorial individual. She's still got a lot of kind of work to do until she becomes territorial. But from a point of view of feeding herself, yes, we can stop worrying now. I'm pretty sure she's more than capable of feeding herself. She, you know, she's hardly been with Tandy over the course of the last two, three months, and she's absolutely in perfect condition. So I don't think we need to worry about her from that standpoint, but she's still got a long road from the standpoint of intruding males, um, females, and her carving out her own territorial space in order to become a successful adult leopard. And that will only really show in, in a year's time, once she reaches sort of two and a half, three, and she's starting to actually mate and those kind of things, then we'll have seen her really kind of get through it and then we don't have to worry nearly as much. But of course, any leopard, there's some worry throughout their life that they get sort of caught by lions or these kind of things. I mean, we know it happens. Um, one of her brothers, in fact, was caught by lions when he was about four years old. So he, um, you know, was already at that point where he was completely independent and looking after himself. But, you know, these things can happen. So it's still a little while to go for Tlalamba until we can be s kind of rest easy in the knowledge that she's um, completely okay and has managed to kind of sort herself out. Now I do need to jump on the radio because I need to be able to get hold of the guys. They're busy calling me. So I'll try and get hold of them now quickly. Yeah, Rick, sorry, we're just live at the moment. Yeah, just come up and I can hear your vehicle. She's got a Makulumala Bamba here. Um, right, so we're going to just get this vehicle in. In the meantime, um, let's send you back up to David and see how his lines are faring. Well, Tristan, very good job uh, with Talamba there. I decided to come out of the car and show you how tall the grass is 
Yes. But then Bunge, who is the camera operator, me today told me to do something different. And he told me, I need to show all of you. My boots, that are zebra boots, and I have these boots because, as you've been saying a few times, the long rains in Kenya are just about to start, and you have to be in nice boots like this. You do not get stuck. Definitely, I will not get stuck on a tamarind mount. This is a tamarind mount. Well, my main purpose of coming here was to show you a very small tree. This tree here that have thorns. We used to call them acacia trees, but I think the name has since changed, and we call them the thorn trees. I think it was just too hot. I had my sunnies on. I think that has gotten better. So we call them now thorn trees. Now, this is a new one that's just coming up. This is a termite mound, and we know termites do not eat anything green. So what termites will do, they'll always eat anything dead stuff, dead grass, stuff like that. So anything that will grow here will not be touched by the termites. And hopefully if this tree is going to be a big tree, the root of the trees itself will be used as a pillar by this termite mound here or by the termites under here. Now, this is a baby uh, thorn tree. Now, I want to show you what I call a fully grown or an adult, yes, running, an adult acacia tree or thorn tree, which is this one right here. I do not know when, but this tree here was brought down by the elephants. In general, thorn trees do not have what we call a taproot. They do not go so much down in the ground. Their roots tend to remain on the surface and it's very easy to bring them down. And one thing we know about the thorn trees, any place you see thorn trees growing, especially one particular species that we call the fever tree, it shows the water table it's very high. Now, this is where the tree was originally and the elephants are the ones that brought it down and I think it's just a small little swing or touch of an elephant trunk just to bring the whole tree down. Now what happened here is they'll get the cambium. If you look carefully there, I'm going to show you, you'll see they have chewed a lot of branches and they get the cambium, the very top or what just surrounds the branches and then after that they left. One side of this tree, especially the left side, you look carefully, the leaves are still green. And out of experience, so long as there is one root that is still touching the ground, this tree will keep growing regardless of having been knocked down by the Ellis. I do not know how many Ellis were here, but I'm trying to imagine it must have been quite a uh, big heart. Now, as much as I'm still smiling and celebrating having seen the sausages, I just want to remind everybody the height of the grass in the marrow now. This is where we are. I'm about five something, and you can see this grass is this tall. And this type of grass is what we call the red oat grass, or Themenda triandra. And I'm imagining if the rains continue, they'll continue growing. Currently, my guess is this is about two meters long. Well, we are always very careful any time we come out of the car. We'll always investigate to make sure there's nothing dangerous. We can deal with rats, we can deal with mice, but of course, uh, not snakes. So whatever number of days the elephant stayed here or hours stayed here feeding on this, you can see the trail they left behind. And it's only the elephants that will be able to bring such a huge tree down and of course leave such huge dunks on the ground. Well, I think that was a good break for me to stretch because the sausages are not going anywhere. They are going to remain where they are. And I thought, because they are a bit flat, why don't I give them a bit of a break? And I also give them a bit of break because I will go back and I will get them right there. I have to jump back in the car and then rewire myself so that I can hear what Casti would want to ask me. Casti is the director running the show in the window control. And thank you, Bungay, and I hope that was not bad, because in the Mara in general, we always tend to remain in the car. Bungay, you happy if we move on? Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. Those boots, you only get them in Africa. So anytime you come, you know, doing a safari with us, you know, 
either in Kenya or World Earth Expeditions, as we call them, you'll be able to get the same boots if uh, you come from countries which rain a lot. Now, we don't want to take chances. What you need to do is just to get prepared so that if the rains come, we'll be ready to go. Apart from that, we'll always carry some nice raincoats and maybe two extra layers should it get cold so that we are able to keep warm. Now, my plans for now is to go look for something else, but after some time, when it cools off, I'll go back to the sausage uh, lions, and I'm sure Steve wants to tell us about the Nukuhumas. <laughs> yes, we do, everybody. We are still here. And uh, Dave is doing a wonderful job of getting the facial expression of this lioness while she has a poo. You do not want to see what's happening at the other side. You really do not. Ugh. I just looked. <laughs> it is um, it's quite, quite horrible, in fact. There's no ladylike behavior amongst lions. I've seen them stand up. Sorry, I'm trying not to dry retch right now. I just looked at a very, very wet and dribbly poo happening there. I think Dave was quite keen to film it, were you, Dave? No. <laughs> There's no ladylike behaviour when it comes to lions. I've seen them stand up and urinate and defecate right where they stand. Ugh, it does make things quite awkward when you're in a sighting for a few days if there's a buffalo or giraffe carcass, because they will just let themselves go right where they stand. And well, if you get any of that on your wheel, eesh, you don't want to do that. That's probably one of the reasons why at the hyena den, the youngsters are so keen to come and smell the car because of all the smells we bring in. So we've now got a, a nice sort of look at the two males. They're just here on the right hand side. They're both lying flat and the one on the right is the Mangeni male and the one on the left is the Unkuhuma male. Now very similar but there's a difference in the face and the eyes. The Mangeni male's got these yellowish sort of eyes whereas the Uncuhuma male has got more brown sort of eyes. But there's a, a difference to the face, which I can't really explain to you looking at them right now. But when you see them both together like that, there is a difference. He's not as pretty, the Mangeni male, as the Uncuhuma male. He, he's definitely recovered most of his fur and all of the injuries he'd sustained with his mange. Just the, the, the bad state of that he was in. He's looking in far better nick than he used to. And by all means, he is a little bit bigger than the Onkuhuma male, although his main development is seemingly a little bit behind. And, well, that's probably got a lot to do with his condition. Um, it's just like a human. If you are ill and you're not in a very good way, you're not going to develop as well as you would if you were in very good condition. So he was struggling. Him and his brothers were trying to follow prides of lions. They had a very bad case of mange and they weren't eating, they weren't getting the nourishments and nutrients that they required and so that would have led to sort of a delayed or stunted development which is what we're seeing because he seems to be a little bit older than the Unkuhuma male but you wouldn't think that by his mane. So there should be five lioness here and I've only managed to count three. So there seem to be two adult females missing. We don't know where Hello, Phil. You want to know if the hippos would come out? Well, you know, hippos probably would still come out. They're not too bothered by lions, really. Um, it's adult females with their calves. It might be a little bit more sort of weary. But a big male hippo, he wouldn't worry too much about a pride of lions. Uh, they would have the hard work getting out of his way. But um, they might also try and choose a different path to get out. They might not walk out exactly where the lions are. But there's nothing really to stop them from walking out. It would just be a protective mother with her calf might think twice about the route she chooses but essentially um, hippos have to come out every night and there is potential for there to be lions around at any stage so they have to sort of take their chances when they leave the water every night anyway but I don't foresee these lines going very far at all. If anything, they're moving like a clock in an anti-clockwise direction as the tree tracks around, or the sun tracks around this really big um, jackalberry tree. 
the shade keeps moving and we were in a very nice patch of shade which moved even more towards us and the lions all moved into that and we've had to reverse away from the lions who sooner or later would have been using our vehicle for shade. Here we go, wonderful scenes down here at Chitra. I was chatting with one of the guides about what we were discussing before about the Unkuhumas and cubs and he says all the cubs have died. There's no sign of them, there's no talk of them. No one's even discussing pregnant females at the moment. But then the two females are missing, so we'll have to have a look at them ourselves and see. Well, anyway, lions are often heralding the approach or the position of vultures, and it seems like David has got one in the sky or in a tree. Well, yeah, Steve, stay there with those lions because uh, I decided to leave mine. So at least I know you got lions to hold on. I'm trying to imagine mine will not go anywhere. But I found this particular vulture here. I'm not sure exactly what he's doing. Of course, you can tell it's quite hot. You got his, or she got his, you know, her wings out, which is an indication that she's rather hot. And this particular vulture here is called the lappet faced vulture or the Nubian vulture. Uh, Nubian vulture, that's the other name for them. And look at her head. She's all bare, no feathers on the head for some obvious reason and why we call them lappet. If you look uh, carefully on the head, you can see or behind the head got, I'm not sure you can see very well, some wrinkled skin. That's why we call them the lappets. But if you look carefully, the wings are out just because it's still rather hot here and it has not cooled off. Now, these particular vultures in general will go in twos. They're very, I would say, uh, I would say they're monogamous vultures. I would say comparing them to the other vultures and why I cannot see the other member unless she could be or he could be some other part. I have no idea. Now, the other vultures, for example, the African white-backed vultures, they'll always be the first one to spot some game. This one will always come last at carcasses. Trying to get some pictures for the vultures for you and show you the vultures that I would have expect to help us lead us to the carcass of the sausage tree pride. Because the African white backed vultures normally move in flocks, something from 5, 10, 20. And now I want to show you how the African white backed vultures look like. And you'll get them all over East Africa, I'm talking of Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania. So that one there, Bungay, this is the African white backed vulture. There. Thank you so very much. And of course, as the name suggests, you see the white patch there. Pfft, that's the white patch there. That's how they got the name. So let's look carefully now at the one we have here, the lapid fist vulture. And that is the lappet vulture. And if you look at the very back there, you can see the skin is a bit wrinkled. Now, in Kenya, we got seven, what we call seven true vultures, seven true vultures. And in this particular area, this are common, African white backed are common. And then they are followed, I would say, in any kill you see, they are followed by the Rupal's griffon vulture which are these ones here. And of course the difference, as much as the African white-backed watch have this white here, just like the Rupert's Griffin watches, but if you look carefully on the feathers there, you can see lots of white and black on the Rupert's Griffin vulture. Now, vultures we do not see, and we do not know what might have happened, or they're still around, and I'm sure they are, is this one here, which is the white-headed African vulture. See that one there, Bungay? And you see that one there is a female, a little bigger in size than the male. But I do not remember the last time I saw a white-headed vulture. Then we, of course, we got the hooded vultures. And as the name suggests, it's like they got a hood on their heads there. These are the hooded vultures. What we do not have here in the Mara is a very special and beautiful vulture that is called the Vulturoin guinea fowl. See that one there? No, it was not that one that I wanted. It was 
the, yeah, the Egyptian voucher. This Egyptian voucher here is one voucher, sorry, that I have not seen for a very, very long time. We are a little bit worried what could be happening to the Egyptian vultures and there have been concern of maybe poisoning either by farmers. I'm not sure for a fact, but it's like months and months since I last saw, maybe years I would say, since I last saw an Egyptian vulture. Well, last one, we're talking about seven vultures there, is the palm nut vulture and very difficult to find in the Mara. But to me, the palm nut vultures got the best call, which I'm going to play for you right now. Right. Funny enough, that call is very similar to the African fishy eagle call, and also somehow they are very similar, those two particular uh, big birds of prey. Well, thank you very much. Hopefully your mate is going to come around. I don't know where she or he is, but maybe on my way back to go back to the sausages, we'll get the two of you together. Let's go back across to Tristan, maybe to get an update on Talamba. Cheers, good luck. Thank Cheers, you. guys. Right, well, we're sitting still with Klalamba. She's decided to now go and park herself in the most hidden spot that there is in this whole area. There's this massive kind of nice open shady spots, but she's decided in amongst the fallen tree is where she wants to lie. And so there's really not very much of a view from where we are right now, but we'll reposition. There's another vehicle that just left. So you can see the damage that she did and how she kind of opened it out. So you're asking what she was doing and you can see how she's basically cuts a circle um, out of that side of that impala exactly where the biggest internal organs are. So let's just reposition slightly and see what we can do here. It's quite interesting. You can see where she kind of sort of fighting with this Impala, Oof. can you see their sense or is the branch in the way? Um, James, have I heard anything on Tundi and whether she's denning? Um, James, I was actually, Rex and I were just sitting discussing it because Rex was in the sighting with me um, and his tracker Mike. We were kind of talking about it and we were saying we wonder if it's the case because she's been super elusive of late and really not easy to find. And so Rex and I were saying, I think maybe it's that time of the year to go and just check all the likely den sites that she likes, just to kind of check around. You never know. I mean, it might be that she's not. Um, but there could be a possibility that she is. When she gets skittish and, well, not skittish, but when she gets shy like this, where you don't see her much, she's normally up to something. So we'll go and try and check around. They told me, though, they had her tracks this morning um, on Central going eastwards towards the sort of eastern boundary. And then Oli and Rusty said they were out this morning too, and they had tracks on Yala Road North. So that area there is where she spent a lot of time with Columba and could very well use as a den site. She has, um, she apparently was you put there when she was a cub um, Rex was telling me about it so we'll see we'll go and scratch around and we'll use our best weapon which is Herbie um, as well as the drone and try and see what we can find it be interesting It'd be quite something if she does have cubs because then her and Nkanyeni are on exactly the same time schedule um, theoretically Tlalamba and little Monzo which is Nkanyeni's previous um, daughter they are roughly the same age and then if you kind of look if they both have cubs now then they're going to have roughly the same age little ones once again which is quite interesting but we'll see i i would be very surprised though if tandy does give birth it would mean that she's been mating with a male where none of us have found her which is possible i mean tortured is a big place and sometimes not that well utilized but it would surprise me that she hasn't been seen i mean she's relaxed enough to kind of find her mating and the noise that's made with mating leopards is that that we would have probably found them here if they were on Juma. So, not sure, James. I, I mean, it's it's a, it's a plausible theory. Um, the last time I saw her, she was definitely very, very big. Um, whether that means that she was pregnant or just very well fed, I'm not sure. Um, but I would, I would like to kind of find her and just try and see her really nicely. I mean, I haven't seen her properly. I saw her briefly the other day, but I haven't seen her and spent lots of time with her this year, really. So I would I'd love for her to kind of show up wouldn't it be nice if she showed up this evening? That would be quite cool to see if she 
kind of is pregnant or if she's, you know, still looking for a mate, be an interesting kind of scenario. Unfortunately, though, we're probably going to have to leave the sighting for a little bit. And um, there's quite a few other cars that do want to come here just now, so we're more than likely going to have to make a bit of space just now. But we'll sit here for a little while longer. James, you say crossing fingers? Uh, uh, yes and no in some respects, because if she has den, then, sh then she's keeping it very quiet, which is going to make life for us very tricky. We're not going to be able to, at this stage, we don't have any idea where she's using. So it'll be a kind of few months of having to try and find her. Um, the best thing that we can hope for is that she has a kill somewhere where she can spend sort of two, three days and we can monitor her movements because that always gives it away immediately. If they have a kill, a big kill, and she moves from it and kind of goes back and forth, then we know definitely that she's got little ones or we can at least see if she's really massively full um, and if she's starting to lactate or anything like that. Um, that's what our best chance is. I just hope that she hasn't given birth on Torchwood. I, I say that even though I know we have access to Torchwood, but our signal there at the moment is just so poor with all the vegetation that it's very difficult for us to go into any places that Tandy likes to walk there. She likes certain drainage lines that we get zero signal at, and so I hope that she's not denning in that side because it would be a bit of a shame if we don't get the same ability to watch her grow up like we do like we did with little Clalumbo. I mean Clalumbo was we were spoilt in that we could spend so much time with her as a little cub. Um, we really were very lucky in many of the sightings that we had and even then it wasn't as good as some of the cubs that you've had. I mean if I remember how it was with Tiani, Tiani was a daily occurrence and it seems like Shadulu and her cubs are pretty much the same as well. So Let's see. Let's see how we go. I mean, you always always hesitant to say for sure that an animal has cubs or anything like that when we haven't really seen the evidence, but it would be nice to have little ones around again. If she does have cubs, then there's no females really out here that has, except I suppose Kuchava, that has any ability to have cubs because they will all have little ones by then. I mean, if Inkanyeni's got this Bifuzuk female, she might have, given the mating she's done. Shadulu, Tiani, Sabui, um, Tandi, if she has one. So will be the boys will have nothing to do they'll be roaming around here being very feeling very sorry for themselves in many respects right what we're going to have to do like i say is there's not really much space for other cars so i think what we're going to do is just give others a chance and we'll come back a little bit later and we'll see what they're up to and in the meantime let's send you back across to steve and those very snoozy tawny cats the incoomers Welcome back, everybody. The Nkuhumas haven't done too much. Their heads lift up every now and again because there's a little bit of a wind that's picked up. And I, don't, I think they're just uncomfortable. You know that when you've got such a full belly, you want to sleep it off, but you just can't quite find it the right position. So I think we've managed to identify Amber Eyes amongst this group. And there she is there in the middle of the screen. That one there, Darby, with the leg up to the right. There we go. There's Amber Eyes there. A little bit of a nick on her on her right ear. And she is a magnificent individual. So she's the one who had, we believe, at least two sets of cubs last year, but they didn't manage to survive. If you go down her body, you'll be able to see that she's an adult. The mammary glands are enlarged, but there's no sort of suckling happening there at the moment. So... <clears throat> The one other female that we sort of identified earlier that uh, we were talking with one of the guides here, he said that she possibly had cubs, but they didn't get very far. They didn't last very, very long at all. We didn't even know about it. So, Uncle Huma's not having as much success in the way of rearing their cubs in this last year or two as have the sausage tree prides. But it comes and goes like that you get stages of growth and development within a pride and well there are 10 individuals here there is one missing the talamati male would have been the 12th we don't know where he's gone to he's been chased off but where he's disappeared to we have no idea cute ticks you want to know if a crocodile could kill an adult lion well it depends on the size of the crocodile of course but yes most certainly a, a medium size or big crocodile like the one they call boris here within chitwa could most certainly kill a lion and the reason they could kill it not necessarily because they are stronger although they are it is the fact that they drown the lion so that is how they would kill the lion they wouldn't necessarily suffocate the lion on the throat or anything like that it would be the ability of them drowning the lion so um, anything can fall prey to a crocodile and a lion is not, not an exception to that 
although you don't often hear of crocodiles taking lions but it is it, and it has happened before in the past what is this youngster doing she's got all sorts of things on the mind let's see i think she's going for a bird there's a bird somewhere there it's all i can make out and there's a hippo by the water maybe she's being very brave <laughs> You are being very silly. If you're gonna go and try and catch a hippo out of the water, I can promise you, you're gonna fail. <laughs> inquisitiveness, inquisitiveness of a cat is often what is going to get them killed, isn't it? Or well, the curiosity, some would say. And now she's lost all interest altogether. So by the middle of this year, all of these youngsters in the Unkoma Pride are going to be around the age of three, sort of June, July time. Um, and that is the sort of time when the females will start becoming reproductive, potentially reproductive. So it might increase the pride's growth as well. Uh, the oldest lioness probably may be a bit too old to be breeding now. We know the purple lioness was mating. We don't know where she is. I think she's the one that is missing. And Amber as well, she's got a horrible track record of late. So maybe it'll be up to the youngsters to help the Unkuhumas grow. But anyway, Lauren seems to have found some more lions up in the Masai Mara. I wonder who she's found. There are lions everywhere. Now, I am the first to admit this is not a great view. We aren't able to offer roads here. However, we have located the River Pride or what we believe to be the River Pride. They're very flat as all lions are at the moment, but just because of exactly where we are, this is prime River Pride location. So I assume, I think I'm almost 99.9% .9 guaranteed that that is them. Now, the reason we've came here and the reason we put so much effort into getting here is because there's still a mystery of the cubs, a huge big question mark over the Olololo River Pride dispute and which cubs got killed. So we can't see any cubs at the minute because they're so flat. But if it is the River Pride, they will get up. I've spent quite a lot of time with them recently. They will get up and I really do believe they will get active once it just gets that bit marginally cooler. So I'm going to make the gut decision to stay with them. I want to see how many are here and if there is any cubs. Because, as we know, cubs unfortunately got killed during that dispute with the dead hippo. And it was automatically thought that it was the Olololos. I honestly thought it was the Olololo cubs. But apparently, now this was not witnessed by us, but witnessed by others, the Olololo female was actually seen, well, one of the Olololo females was seen with cubs again. Hmm. Huh. How can that be if they all died at that sighting? So there is a bit of debate. Was it a river pride cub that was killed? Was it Ololoro? It really, we don't know. What we need to do now is spend time with these animals and actually try and figure out who has cubs and who doesn't. So sorry to confuse you all, but this is exactly why we are here. It's very frustrating that we can't off roads. However, the lions will get up and I'm more than sure we'll get a better view of them at some point. Jackie's saying there's a lot of theories and yes indeed there is I obviously cannot vouch one way or another I cannot confirm but I do listen to everything everyone is saying here and it would be good to get some answers and unfortunately in order to get answers you do have to spend some time with the animal even if they're flat as pancakes like these ones are now you do just have to sort of have patience wait and solve all the mysteries and get answers to all these theories it was a horrible horrible day for Pat during that incident and and naturally we did see two cubs dead we weren't able to confirm the third one but it was just thought or assumed should i say that the third one also died so it is time to really unravel that mystery and we have found the river pride so that's exactly why we're going to stay here it's just very frustrating that we can't get closer so i do apologize for the below average views of them 
but we have watched this pride numerous times trying to hunt warthog, stock, impala. They are quite an active pride, so I hope they'll wake up soon. I think Missy Anna is asking about finding things in Namara and is it more challenging? I think that was the question. Well, the Mara is just so vast. It is just a huge, gorgeous, beautiful landscape. You can drive for miles. Now, you, you do always see animals. Without a doubt, you will never drive and not see anything. You will always at least see some impala. I mean, around us here, I've seen Thompson's gazelles, some buffalo, warthog, impala, and that's just scanning this area here. So it's filled with animals, but in order to find them, sometimes you've got to drive a little bit far and that does take time. Whereas Juma is a lot smaller, a lot more condensed and it is far easier to drive around. Whereas here, if we hear that there's an animal somewhere away in the distance, then indeed it will take us quite some time to get there. So it's not necessarily more challenging, Mrs. Anna. It just, I would say, is more time consuming. So one more update. Why don't we look at almost update? We did hear of a ch cheetah this morning that was very, very close to where we live, just at the bottom of the escarpment. And it was from the hyena research program. They told me there's a cheetah and it turns out it was a female and I haven't had proof yet, but I think my heart tells me it could be my queen bee. So tomorrow, my plan is to absolutely find out who this cheetah is. So we're going to try and get in a bit better position here and <laughs> maybe see some more than lion bottoms and see what we can do. But for now, we're going to send you back down to Steve. Well, it is Sunday, but we'll give it a cat a day. Nonetheless, lions, lions, leopards everywhere. And, well, you're very lucky that you missed it, everybody. This lioness in frame right now, I think, is the youngest of the adults. And, well, she stood up and released her bowels, and both Dave and myself could not contain ourselves. We both nearly uh, voided our contents on the side of the car. It was very horrible. There's something very, very <laughs> disgusting about lion poo directly after they've had a meal. Because all that comes out really is just a slurry of blood. Uh, it's not very nice to see. So I'm going to leave it there and not talk about it anymore before the image of it comes back to haunt me. Dave is still laughing on the back. Because she even got some on the back of her leg and then she urinated. And it's just lines. There's just nothing... There's nothing elegant, elegant about the way that they behave. Their, their table manners are something to be desired. Um, I suppose they do love each other very much, but they really don't have any... I remember Amber Eyes, actually. Every time I've been with the Unkuhuma Pride, Amber Eyes always steps up, goes about 40, 50 yards away, does a business, and then comes back to the Pride. The rest of the Pride, on the other hand, so far, has not been as accommodating. There she is. Panting heavily as the diaphragm is pushed up into her chest, making the lungs much smaller. She's a very, very pretty lady. The tools of the lion trade right there. I'm terribly sorry about the description of those visuals, everybody just had to get it off my mind sorry that I had to indulge you in such a horrible affair but I'm um, just also quite fortunate you quite fortunate we weren't live at the time because um, our cam ops have a tendency to find these things don't you Darby mm -hmm. yeah hey, Dave actually asked me why doesn't um, the big documentaries and all the big documentaries out there ever film animals pooing and I said well it's not something people really want to see Hello, Mau Mau. You want to know about a lioness that was really badly beaten up? Um, I'm not sure. Um, when did this happen? Um, if it's an old story of the injury on the back hip, the female is right here in front of us. The one in the front of the frame, the hip, is looking very much better than it used to. But I'm not sure what lioness you're talking about that got beat up. 
Um, I'm not sure if I missed something. Please, if you'd elaborate. Or maybe Emma can tell me. Darby, do you know anything about the lioness that was beaten up? Sorry, Mau Mau, I'm not very sure what happened. I honestly haven't seen the Unkuhuma Pride in, it must be about a month now since I've seen them. And I don't foresee them going too far this evening. Okay, so Emma's saying there was a lioness from a couple months ago had a very bad eye and seemed to, like she'd had a beat down. Well, I'm not really sure. I haven't seen her, and if anything, I haven't noticed any individual here uh, with any injuries, uh, apart from a number of ticks on the eyes or the old wound on the back here, or a couple of fresh cuts and scratches on the faces and heads of the lions that no doubt were from the feeding that took place earlier today when they caught themselves a young giraffe. By the size of their bellies, I'm going to assume it was a medium-sized giraffe and not a little baby because they're all rather full. Get a good 50 to 60 pounds, 70 pounds in their belly at one time. And uh, well, if you divide that by 10, that is a very big animal. Nice to see them though. Everyone is saying these are such cute lions. Cute, I suppose you could use the word cute. One thing I remember when I went to the Mara was that the lions were looking in very good nick. Apart from the old lioness with the injury, their fur and everything was looking great. And then while I was away, that was when the whole Mangani male sort of story happened, all the mange and those those two followers on and then the three follows on and then just the one guy and since that's happened I came back I remember uh, when was that in December and I st they really don't look great I mean their fur is all it's all manky and there's definitely signs of, of mange on them in all different places but you know they are a healthy pride of lions but their their coats and their, their well their pelts whatever you want to call it are not looking as good as they did before I left in August September, August, they were looking very, very, in very good nick, well oiled and just beautiful. And uh, since the arrival of the Manganis, they're all looking a little bit scrabbly. I wonder if any of you out there agree with me or tell me if I'm talking nonsense. But I remember being quite noticeably shocked when I saw them when I got back in December. Maybe that's just because the Mara lions have just got such good coats, they just look they look much better up there, I suppose. Also, we'd come out of the migration where the lions up there had been eating left, right, and center, whatever what they wanted to. Whereas down here, the Unkuhumas scratching around trying to find whatever they can find. And also the woodland is quite dangerous. We were looking at the one young male earlier. He had that big injury on the inside of his leg. That is, in fact, the Unkuhuma young male. And um, I'm not sure what happened, but possibly from a, a wooden stick or a, a log or some sharp object while hunting, and maybe a piece of zebra wood or something. Um, these injuries do happen to lions, and uh, sometimes the injuries could be debilitating, but being in a pride allows them to follow each other around and to benefit from the efforts the pride can put in. This old female here, testament to that. Okay, well, we're going to stay here with the Unkuhumas as long as we possibly can. And uh, while we do that, let's go up to the Masai Mara with David, who I think has left the Sausage Tree Pride. Yeah, Steve, I think you're one of the luckiest uh, naturalists today because I don't know when the Nukumas were seen last. So that's the very good news that you've been able to uh get them make sure you do not go anywhere stay with them as long as it takes now i left the sausages as you all know and i thought i'm gonna bumble around to see if i could see anything else and the reason i did that because it was rather hot and i could tell there were some crackers because i kept smelling something there i never saw the carcass i want to st i still want to believe it is still there 
and I will go back because by the time I go back, either the wind will have picked up and it should be a lot easier for me to get hold of the carcass. And of course, once I get the carcass, I'll be able to see maybe them eating. Now, why I've come here is because I got some wind. Sorry, I'm not doing a three point turn because the road here is quite narrow. I might be doing, end up doing about 10 point turn for good reason because there's a drainage on one side and drainage on the other side. I've come here because I got some wind somewhere that there could be a spotted cut, just like what we have with Tristan. So I am now going to investigate and find out if it's there or not. But I will not tell you as yet what kind of spotted cut I'm talking about, but I'm sure you all know, if anything, there are only two spotted cuts we could be talking about, you know, big size, either a cheetah or a leopard. Or did I give it away? Not really. I just said a uh, spotted cat. Not exactly like what Tristan has, but I am going to investigate whether what my friend told me is true. In the village I come from, we have always had a proverb. And, and what I'm trying to say is uh, we have a proverb from where I come from when you're told of something and you're not sure, you'll always say a bad whisper to you something. So until you're 100%, you never commit. So let's slowly move and we're gonna be getting to that particular area and find out if it's something or not. Jane, good question there. And you're asking, are there any animals, Jane, with no predators? Jane, I would say, I highly doubt. Who doesn't have a predator? Well, I might say maybe a hyena. Who eats hyena, Jane? I might even talk of vultures, Jane. Who eats vultures? So as far as I'm concerned, most of the animals that we got here, Jane, got predators. I'll be counting to you a few that I would guess maybe that do not have predators as soon as we find out if we are able to get the surprise. Now we're gonna swing the camera and find out exactly where this cat is, unless it's flat in the grass there. And I think it's, oh yeah, I see it is way down in the grass. Not sure the Bunge will be able to get it, but this is the surprise I'm talking about. And very unusual place for him to be. And I'm sure you can all guess who this is. Let's see if you can see the spots or you can see the rosettes and you'll be able to tell me who this is. That is how they hide. Not sure to say whether that's how they hide or how they camouflage. It's almost impossible just to see it. But my guess is this is a leopard and I'm sure you can tell from the markings the rosettes there. But whoever saw it must have done some magical work to have seen it. You remember earlier I was telling you of that small little uh, proverb we have in the village. If you're not sure of something 100%, you do not commit yourself. So what you say, you'll say, a bad told me something. So even if it's not right, you're fine. But, you know, so what I'll do is try and reposition myself and see whether we might get a better look because where he is, totally hidden and my guess is this could be the shepherd tree leopard let me see if i reposition myself we may have a better look that's impossible that's what's aim in the final control who has taken over directing the show this is pretty crazy cover flight because whoever saw it you want me to keep going or are you happy there Back up a little bit. Are you, are you happy there, Bungay? All right. Let's have a look and see whether we'd be lucky to see it. Bungay thinks you've got a better visual there. Not the very best, but I would say it's a lot better than before. So my guess is this is the shepherd tree male. This is his territory. And he has been in this domain for quite some time. The last we saw him, he had some uh, kill and he had some uh, 
Elan baby on top of a tortured tree. And that is like what, two, three days ago. So ideally five days ago, five days he will go without another kill, which will be fine. But in between, you know, they catch up small little birds. Uh, they could catch guinea fowls, they could catch francolins. So many birds that could catch like where exactly he is. I would not confirm 100% it's him, but my guess is this is the shepherd tree male. You can see the heat, you can see the panting a little bit. Warm, hot day. But that's an impossible position to spot this cat. I want to double confirm with my friend how he saw it because the grass is that high. You remember earlier when I was out of the car, the grass was about two meters long. And I'm trying to imagine this leopard, the body size could be about a feet, about 10 inches in thickness. And being there in that grass is like a joke. I'll do, I'll do one more round, see whether you can see the head part of it. And then I'm sure I'll be happy because I'll really have to thank my friend who saw this leopard who called it for me because I do not know whether I would ever, ever see it. Very good. Not sure why Tristan has left Salamba. Would you, Tristan, explain to us what you've done? We have, for the meantime, it's just giving a chance to everybody else to view her where she went and lay. It was very difficult, and so there's only really space for kind of one vehicle to see nicely. So we're just letting everybody else roll through before our TV show starts a little bit later. But the good news is that there's a couple of things that are happening. Um, by the sounds of it, there's tracks of Tingana coming straight towards where Tlalamba is. And so we're busy just doing circles around just trying to see if we can pick him up. Wouldn't that be funny if he does arrive, given we were talking about it? It's not surprising if he does, given his propensity to find um, carcasses. So we're just kind of doing some loops, just in case he pops out somewhere close by um, and he makes himself known. And so that's why we're kind of hanging around in the area. There also sounds like there's a lioness at Twin Dams, which I have absolutely no idea where she would have come from, but she's also around, so I don't know if Steve if he has to leave his lines, then he can go and check that out as well. Ah, there's a beautiful bird of prey in the tree. Seems like as good a time as any to stop and have a little look. So in the dead tree, I want to just double check. It looks like a young marshal, um, but let's make 100% sure. Or could it be a brown snake eagle? No, brown snake eagle. My mistake. Sorry, I was kind of not looking very well at all. That's a horrible call. Naughty Tristan slap on the wrist but yes <laughs> brown snake eagle is what it is um it's because of the way it was sitting like that it had that kind of little whitish crest so that's why i thought maybe martial eagle but it's most definitely a snake eagle you can see by that bright yellow eye and the big rounded head when it sort of turned to face us and then of course the brown coloration is um is exactly kind of that for a brown snake eagle very common bird here we see them quite a lot this particular one we see fairly regularly it bounces between sort of where we are now and a little bit further towards the the west and kind of flies around and follows the Mulwati for the most part that's where it generally kind of hangs around but you'll see it on sort of either side and always sitting in big trees like this um, these big sort of dead trees are the perfect place for a bird that relies heavily on its sight to be able to spot um, creatures that move around in the grass and that are not actually that easy to see and so you find that they'll sit there and they'll watch and wait and and as soon as they then spot something like a snake moving then off they go and down they come and they grab whatever snake it is and they'll go after any snake really it doesn't matter how venomous it is um, they have a few adaptions that allows them to be able to kind of stay out the way one is element of surprise and try and hit the snake in a place where it can kind of disable the snake and, and almost break its spine with those talons the second thing is obviously they lack feathers on their legs which we can't see from this angle but that allows them to have these hardened kind of scales on their legs which makes it much harder for fangs to penetrate their legs jeffrey have we ever got footage of them i'm not sure safari live yeah we might have actually in the mara i seem to remember the one time i i saw it and i think david has seen it before as well 
can't remember if it was during the period we were not live when I got it, but I know that David's had it. I, th I think David or Isaac, one of the two, has had uh, a snake eagle grab a snake. Um, I've seen it many times, but I don't know if we've got any footage from Juma. I can't recall any of sightings from myself. Um, I'm just trying to think. No. The most famous footage to kind of come out of this this area with regards to this is uh, footage that was taken on Little Gauri Chitwa cut line of a, a snake eagle that went after black mamba and then got hit by the black mamba and, and venom was injected and then Tamba and Tandi arrived. And so you had two leopards, a black mamba and a snake eagle all embroiled in a sort of standoff with one another. Um, so that footage is pretty insane. And shame, that poor snake eagle, it obviously got nicked by it or something the snake managed to somehow damage its wings because we found it there that afternoon still sitting panting lying there with no snake or leopards um and was kind of just lying there unfortunately right so well our bumper the sunday continues as it sounds now steve has decided to get some spots of his own Well, thank you very much. What an afternoon we are having. If it was not a cat day before, it is certainly a cat day today, everybody. And we have found the Queen of Juma's daughter, Kuchava. Potentially the father was Mvula, who I only saw once back in uh, January last year, February last year, before he made his disappearance. And she's just hanging out here in the long grass on Chitwa. So Chitwa is providing for us wonderfully today. And you might ask how do we identify these leopards and well it does take some practice everybody um there are identikits and you can look at her now they're looking at the top three spots above her whiskers can you see that there are three spots just behind her nose the top line we call them the spot pattern and she has got three on the left hand side and three on the right hand side we've managed to see them already but it did take me a moment or two to identify so Kuchava means scared. To be Chava in Shangan means to basically run or to be scared of something. You're scared of something. And I've never noticed her to be scared. I've only seen her once before. I'm on the border of Chitwa and Torchwood. Look at her. Becky, what a drive indeed. Isn't she gorgeous? Look at those beautiful eyes. She's also got quite a prominent sort of dark patch underneath her right eye there. It's one of the characteristic features as well. You see, it's quite dark just under the right eye. And there's some other identification features that I haven't yet quite started figuring out. But you could see by that last shot that she had three and three. And she was born in August, September of 2014. Makes her almost five. A leopardess in her prime. And Tandi used to hang out a lot here on Chitwa. And then she must have made space for Kuchava and then moved north, spending more time on Juma. And now she's making space for Tlalamba. And now she's moving more east. So the life of a leopardess is really hard, isn't it? Making space for your children to move in, to take up residence. Kathy, in Ohio, we believe she does have one. Um, I haven't seen her, but I know Taylor last year was very lucky to be able to see Kuchava with her youngster. I've yet to see the cub. I don't know where she is. I think it was a girl last I, last I heard. But this is only the second time I've seen Kuchava. And... Um, so, yeah, in November last year, she had a cub. don't know what happened if it's still around it's been ages since we've actually found or been with a leopard on Chitwa but I know someone we could definitely ask that Tristan and the leopard whisperer and he would probably be able to tell us for sure what's going on with this lovely young cat and well she's very pretty you see the camouflaged So everybody, are you quite concerned about her proximity to the Unkuhumas? Yes, I mean, she's about five minutes drive away, um, but there's also a dam that separates the two. So 
a, a young leopard like this doesn't get to five years old without being quite wily and able to climb trees. So don't worry, everybody. Leopards live out here with lions. Lions come and go. I mean, we saw Tingana last year walking along and suddenly the Avoca male stood up for him and Tingana just went, okay, just walked around and went up a tree for safety. Uh, it is part and parcel of what they do out here. They have evolved with lions. Uh, and they have strategies for dealing with lions. Obviously, they're not going to try and confront a lion, but it's why they need to be quiet and be able to be a very alert and understanding of what's going on in the bush. And then if lions do approach, well, they just jump up a tree. So don't worry, everybody. She's in a very good place on the other side from the watering hole, from the lions, a good couple of kilometers away, a mile or so. Well, when it rains, it pours, and today the showers from the sky are raining cats. Yeah, it's a very true, Steve, and that's very interesting to have, you know, Kuchava pretty close to the Nukuhumas, eh? And I'm sure, you know, these two cats are not friends, and I do not think they'll ever be friends. Well as it is typical of lions to go flat. Not only lions, sometimes in general we say most cats could go flat if they have the right conditions of everything. Food, water, a nice place to bend in, and you know, I would say lots of good air. Look at now where the shepherd trimmel is. Oh, good stretch. Why don't you just wake up and you just have a quick view of your face? Please do, please do. Yeah, good boy, wonderful. Yon, rise and shine if you want to. Catch all those flies that you think are disturbing you. I do not know how many you're able to catch. Yeah, this is very healthy. As I said earlier, a few days ago, I would say three, four days ago, he killed for himself a baby eland and he hoisted it over a tortured tree. And, you know, he stayed there for three, four days eating it until you know uh, he finished it but it was rather sad when i was watching him eating it because apparently the mother of that baby was not very far it was about 200 meters just looking on top of that tree and i think she had a lot of uh, maternal instinct hoping that possibly you know things would change it's interesting because this one past month we had had some very Sad sightings, you know, myself, Lorraine and Patrick. Patrick, he is the one who saw two prides fighting, the River Pride and the Oral Pride. And we haven't get gotten a proper name for that particular fight. Personally, I've been calling it the Battle of the Mara River. And we had two or three cubs that were lost. And wondering whether each cub came from either Pride or both of them came from the Oral Olos. And I'm sure all of you know I am trying to design a song. I'm trying to write a song to the older Lolos just to console them. And the song is still cooking. And you might be doing that song, Me and Bungay. And then I think a week later, 10 days later, Lolo saw this giraffe that had dropped a baby that was dead. And that giraffe mother stayed there for as long as it took. Two days later, 40 hours, 48 hours later, she was still there. The baby was dead. And she was dealing with hyenas who wanted to come and eat that baby. It was a sad moment for Patrick, a sad moment uh, for Lauren, and maybe also a sad moment for me three, four days ago to see an Elan mother looking on top of a tree where the baby of uh, that Elan or that mother was being devoured by this male here. That's why he looks in such good shape, and I'm sure he might go another few more days without eating anything. And we call him the shepherd tree leopard because he loves climbing shepherd trees. Very good, very good. So because he is not trying to be very active, I want him to have a little bit of a rest and go back to my sausages. Let's find out if Lawrence Lyons could be doing anything. very inactive we have got a slightly better view of them i must say we did reposition and we have uh, 
well, you know, a little bit of a better view, but it is getting so much cooler here at the moment. The weather is changing and of course the sun is setting. So I really, really believe it's not gonna be long until these lions do get up. Now, if James could just do me a favor and sort of just look over to the escarpment there you will actually see that is the escarpment way in the distance where our camp is so the river pride we're actually seeing them a lot a lot more than we ever have because they are sort of right at Kichwa airstrip which is exactly where Busara was for a while at the bottom of our escarpment so they're a pride that we're getting to know more and more and of course we don't know all about them but we assume there's about five adult females from what we know and there's actually a lot of young adults well sub adults if you like we think between five to seven and most of them do appear to be males from what we gather again to be confirmed and there is cubs around and that is exactly what i am hoping to see once they do get a little bit more active fingers crossed they do get up and they don't just decide to sleep right through the night which is what i would do and wake up in the morning i am really hoping we do get some movement from these lions it was a big debate to leave that female earlier who's still looking like an olololo and of course we've came here because we want to catch up with this pride because we're getting to know them more and more and what is interesting is if you look at the environment Environment that we're in right now the airstrip very short grass perfect for a cheetah it's exactly why Busara loved it there's plenty of prey around and it's short grass it's open it's visible you can see for miles but for lions it almost contradicts their preferable habitat lions do much better when there's longer grass and they can of course stalk but the river pride seem really successful here but Patrick has actually watched them make many failed hunts I think he's seen four he probably correct me if I'm wrong on this one so there's been lots of failed hunts by these lions and it most likely is because it's so visible if they are stalking they're still very very visible in the grass I myself actually watched them stalk some warthog but they seem to be thriving and surviving here like the flies that are landing on my face and right to the other side of us is indeed the Mara River which is where they get their name from but I'm sure I didn't need to explain that to you all so the name comes from here and it borderlines the Olo Lolo territory which is why they did have that dispute because I think well from what I believe the hippo was right on the sort of territorial boundary which is why both these prides had a very disturbing dispute actually but this is very much river pride area John is saying it should be interesting as the migration starts. Yes, indeed it will be. We don't know quite when the migration will start, of course. It's one of these things that doesn't happen on a specific date, but it is around June, July that migration is expected to start. And David himself has a theory that migration will start a little bit earlier this year. So fingers crossed it does. I'm sorry, I have flies all over my face. I'm not sure why they're so attracted to me tonight, but it's better. It, I'm not a fan. So yes, John, migration will be interesting with all these different lion prides, coalitions. We did go in search of two males earlier, but we weren't able to locate them. So we came here to the River Pride and we're just being very patient and hoping that our beautiful lions do get up and we can see some cubs with them and start to unravel some of the mysteries. But this is where we see the River Pride constantly. So it's almost not a guarantee, but you've got a very high chance if you come to this area, you will bump into the River Pride. The Marsh Pride are not too far away. The Olololo Pride are not too far away. And a little bit further ahead, you have the Awinos. So there's so many lions around here. So my lions are flat, but I do believe Steve has a leopard who is on the move. Well, my cat indeed, Lauren, has just decided to stand up and to walk directly towards where the Unkuhuma lions are lying up. I'm only joking, folks. They are still very far away, but she is headed in the direction of Chitwa Watering Hole, which is what you would expect about this time of evening from a cat to start moving towards somewhere to go get a drink. Um, also looking for unsuspecting prey that could potentially be hanging around or making their way to or from water. 
beautiful scenes watching this leopard move through the golden light. It's a very pretty leopard. Tandi has got some very pretty lineage. I must admit. You see the very elegant neck. Couldn't mistake this for a male. And I wonder if she's maybe spotted something underneath the little thicket to the left. It's not unlikely, or well, not uncommon for a Franklin or a scrub air to be hiding around in there. And we often find our leopards moving through, going from one bush to another. There we go. Did you see that look she gave us, Dave? That was a typical Tundi look, wasn't it? <laughs> that look Tani gives, she half cocks her ears, gives that little look like, what are you looking at? <laughs> indeed, like mother, like daughter. She does indeed, everybody. You can almost, you know, when you spend enough time with these cats, you can start actually really identifying who their lineage is, who their parents are. And well, we're going to see if we can follow her. It's just headed a little bit forward, so <clears throat> this is going to be a little bit thick. Obviously we want to do so very quietly, very little effort. We've got a very nice small car that can just punch through little holes in the bush here. Switch the aerial there. Still got her off to the left over here, Dave. Hello, Tim. I, I'm not sure whether Columba and Kuchab have ever seen each other before. I'm not really sure. I'm just helping the other guides who are with me here to navigate towards where she is. She's just off to my left. I'm not sure if they have. I mean, Tandi hasn't been or spent too much time on Chitwa since the birth of Columba that I am aware of. You've got her there, Darby. See how well camouflaged she is in this environment. So I'm not sure, but I don't think Kachava would be very nice to Tlalamba, to be honest with you. Leopards are secretive, the leopards are solitary, and well, even Tandi gets a bit annoyed with her daughter, so it's only the parental bonds between them that sort of keep them quite strong. We're going to just come through to the left-hand side over here. She's laying down now, so that's a good thing. I've got a log there, Darby. Small log. Okay. Well, while we navigate through the thickets here to try and get a better view of this leopard, Tristan is watching the golden orb of the sun set in the west. We do have a sunset, a very, very pretty sunset. It's a beautiful, beautiful evening. It really is the most kind of nicest weather that you can have is in the autumn and the springs of the South African year. Um, it's not kind of, I don't know what the word is, it's, it's not long for those both of those sort of seasons, but when you do have them, they have produced the most glorious days. And what we were talking about just now is just how much drier it kind of looks and how different it feels. There's a very different feel in the air. There's this kind of coolish wind that blows. The sun doesn't seem to have the same strength as it did two, three weeks ago. So we're starting to slowly but surely now kind of go into that winter period and that sun is losing its sort of spike. Anyway, we're back with Klalamba. Just gonna reposition ourselves slightly just so we can actually see her nicely because she's still hiding away behind her log, but we thought we'd just show you the sunset first. We did a little loop around looking for Tingana. Saw his tracks, but you know, they kind of gone into a very thick block. General direction is kind of this way, um, but um, it's still a long way to go until he gets here and he could, and they're a little bit further north of where we are, but you never know. Maybe he does arrive and he gets into our area and we'll be able to kind of see him arrive with the little princess. Wouldn't that be quite nice? Are you having the best time, girl? Are you playing with the log, hmm? Look at that face, isn't that sweet? She's just lying off to my right hand side at the moment and is looking very much like she used to when she was a little cub when she used to put her paws on the logs and kind of 
lay her head back and try and kind of look at you and it reminds me of when she was little at this time sort of last year but that's just one happy cat at this stage i mean fortunately i don't think it's going to be that long that she's that happy but for now she's reveling in the fact that she has a nice big meal and she's well fed it's cooling down and so this is a happy place for a young leopard to be that's for sure and she's got water close by too which is even better i have a funny feeling we're going to see a lot of clalamba this winter around the lodge i think much like what we were discussing earlier in that she's going to be much like hosanna in many respects um she's going to be that kind of cat that spends a lot of time in this area well i hope it will be that way good we'll stay here we probably until you know the end of the evening and in the meantime let's send you back across to steve who apparently is doing a sunset showdown Indeed, we're going to have leopard and sunset shots at the same time, Tristan. Now, why don't all the viewers put a quick little poll through there to tell us whose sunset was prettier? Mine and David's or Tristan Dix with Senzum Keys? Ours is the black monkey orange bush. Very, very artistic, David. Very artistic. But while we're being so artistic, should we jump back over to the leopard that we've managed to find? <laughs> he stood up and walked away. <laughs> okay. Well, that's how it works, everybody. That's how it works. Um, she was lying down next to us, and uh, Dave's artisticness uh, led to us um, looking away from her for a moment. And all it takes is a moment. And um, a moment later, she's going to get up and walk away. So that's the way it works, everybody. We are live. We are interactive. There's nothing stopping these animals from moving however they would like to. Um, the only difficulty we have from time to time is keeping up. <clears throat> We're just going to punch through over here. Try to get past this other vehicle. I think we're a little bit smaller than they are. Be able to go through these little branches a little bit easier then. Okay, so they've got visual over there. Just get around the side here. It starts to open up a bit. The black monkey orange develops into these very thick stands. And you can see how it suddenly disappeared here. It is a very well-renowned bush encroacher. So, okay, so let's see if we can spot her here. It's just disappeared. There she is, Darby. We're just going through over there. <laughs> Kimberly she takes after her, her mum like that. Tundi can just d vanish as well. Okay, Darby's got it. There she is moving through the thickets, lost her. Okay, well we've lost her. Let's come around the other side. It's very thick there. We don't want to go pushing through. Okay, well, Let's um, try to find Kruchava, and while we're there we go, she's turned. And while we do that, let's go to her niece, who is busy eating some food once again. Well, that's what happens, Steve, when you try and start a competition without stating that there's a competition to start with and try and beat our sunset, then you lose a leopard for karma. And that's what happens because Senzo and I didn't state that it was a competition. We were just admiring the sun. And then Steve tried to make it something. And now, he, like I say, the karma is that he's lost his leopard because he was cheating. Anyway, Clalamba has since woken up. It's been perfect timing. We left her. She was sleeping. We came back and took us only, what, five minutes. And she's awake again and having another little feed. And there is a very, very upset squirrel that has now disappeared. But they, unfortunately, the, the sort of stump behind her, Senzo, I don't know if you can show it. But to the right, there's a little dead tree that's a broken off tree. Now, there's a squirrel living inside there. And Clalumba being where it is means the squirrel who's trying to come out and move off can't go anywhere because she's right here all the time and is very unhappy about the situation and constantly is shouting, which is not good. 
because the noise that that squirrel makes could very easily attract various other predators in this area. Look at how nice that little light is on her face. I mean, obviously there's stomach content everywhere, which is not so nice, but it's nice kind of light on her sort of face itself. I'm still impressed that she managed to actually bring this down. It really is an incredible feat for a small leopard. You know how strong these impalas are. It just gives you an idea of how strong the cats are themselves, and particularly leopards. They're known to be one of the stronger sort of predators pound for pound. Yes, clean your nose. It's full of blood. Can't have a red nose. When is Red Nose Day? There used to be a thing called Red Nose Day. Lisa, you say, wow, the impala is bigger than her? Yes, it is, by a long way, actually. You don't really get a sense of it now that she's turned the impala, but earlier she had the impala side on and was feeding kind of behind it, and the impala is massive in comparison to her, much bulkier than what she is. So I'm afraid her ability to bring this down is great, but still a long time until she's going to be able to hold on to kills like this. She's got a lot more work to do. Is it at the end of the year? I don't know. I mean, I think it's a South African thing. I'm not sure. Maybe you guys are going to be know Red Nose Day. Is it a worldwide thing? I know in South Africa, it used to be a big thing. It's not so much anymore, but it used to be massive in, in South Africa and you, everyone would put on a red nose and at school and things used to think it was very funny. Is it a British thing? But worldwide, Emma's giving me a, all the information as I'm talking about it. When is it though, Emma? You're going to have to Google for me so that I know what date it is. But Columba could compete in that today because she's got a little red nose from all the blood that she's collecting as she's eating. Kirsty is Googling. Oof, now we've got the two redheads in control of our show. This is going to be something. And the two of them are like a little ninja clan that uh, control what goes on in, in FC and make sure that all the right decisions get made. You've got to be scared when the two, two uh, redheads are together because otherwise, you know, one false move and then they ninja you and they, you're in big trouble. So I'll have to, we have to be on our best behavior, Senzo. Otherwise, we're going to be in trouble with the two. You know what, Sense? Let's try and see. I just sense it. Let's move and see if we can get a few from the front, um, which I would like to, but I think there's going to be a bit of foliage. Sense, do you think we can sneak in here? Let's try here. Yeah? Okay, we're going to try and sneak through this little gap. You can see beautiful orange sun. Just careful your head, Sense. Sharp thorns there. Eh? You all right? You okay, Sense? Good, good, good. I'm not piercing you. How's that there? Is that good? More. Just double checking because the camera's line and my line is a little bit different. So Senzo's trying to sort out our aerial as well as we kind of <laughs> negotiated that area. But I think this will be a slightly better angle for us. Oh, there's a stick. Hold on, Senzo. Let me just go slightly forward for you. Let's just see if we can get rid of that stick in front of her face. No. Back or forward? There's good. Okay. Unfortunately, the stick is not going to go anywhere, I'm afraid. So we're going to just have to deal with the one stick that is in front of her face and quite a few organs that are there as well. So if you're a bit squeamish, now is the time to probably look away because you can see she's been chomping a bit on the liver there. And then there's the rest of the internal organs that are kind of behind that. Not sure I'd want my nose in there. I think it would smell that good. Although it's I, I, funny enough, when she opened the stomach, you could smell, and it smelled just kind of like rumen does, which is not really that pungent. It's funny; it doesn't actually smell too bad at all. It's kind of got a kind of grassy sort of smell to it, um, and then the rest just smells like blood, which is not too bad when it's fresh. It's in two, three days' time, this carcass would absolutely heave with the scent of death, but for now, it's still just fine because of how fresh it is. You're going to have a big tummy by the end of this. How can you hear her as she chews through the skin? Alaramoya, yes, anatomy class 101, thanks to Klalamba, with lecturer Klalamba, actually, we should do it. Um, as she goes through all the sort of organs, and you can see all the little bits 
inside there. Yeah, like I said, a bit, bit on the macabre side to look at for long periods, but interesting to kind of see how it's all arranged when it's inside. I mean, it's moved a bit because she's been feeding, but essentially you can kind of roughly see how it's all arranged. Now, uh, apparently you can also hear her chewing quite nicely. It's nice when she grabs the skin because that makes a lot more noise than the rest. You can see how she feeds now. It's quite interesting how she uses her canines and basically to rip and pull up and break the sort of um, bits of meat. And then from there, she gets it into the side of the mouth and then she'll basically use those connachals to cut it and, and sever that flesh from the bone or, or whatever it's attached to or just a chunk of flesh itself. So it's an interesting kind of way that she feeds. She uses the front of her mouth and then turns sideways to be able to break it. Now, I believe we're winning the Sunset Challenge, Senz. That's exciting. Well done, Senzo. It's all Senzo's work. I didn't do much. In fact, our Sunset's actually gotten better, talking of the Sunset. You can see little Columbus. she's still feeding. So we'll show you one more time what it looks like now. The sun has gotten a bit lower, and it's a beautiful orange color. And you can see there's a little bit of haziness in the air, and this is more those kind of, I call them dirty sunsets that we get in the winter months. And generally, these are caused by the fact that a lot of dust gets into the air. And it's starting to happen now because we're having so little rain that more and more dust is being blown up. And you kind of get these more, I don't know what the word is. They're not as crisp and clear as um, the sunsets after a good rainstorm. This one seems like it's a little bit dirty and that the air is a bit hazy um, from the dust that's in it. It's a typical kind of wintry sunsets when you get a sun like that. And there's the, the bush off to the west looking very, very good at the moment. Well done, Senzo. You, you've done a sterling effort with your sunset today. Right. We'll keep sitting here. I mean, there's not really much else to go and do. I think we're going to hope for Tingana's arrival as well as the Juma clan. Maybe we'll get them all here at some point. And in the meantime, let's send you back across to Lauren with some very, very sleepy cats. But different lions. Surprise! We have changed sex and we are now with two very handsome males known as the Kitwa boys. And these boys were also the ones involved in the Ololo River Pride dispute. And here they are. And guess what they're doing? <laughs> Sleeping. If we just look at the one at the back, now I really wish it would put its head up on cue, but it probably won't. You can see the black color of that mane at the bottom. It's actually really, really dark. When we arrived here, they did at least put their head up to acknowledge us, and it is a huge mane of thick black hair. And these males really are in their prime. Prime, very dominant, and they have been seen mating with both the Ololos and the River Pride, which is most likely why they stayed out of the dispute. You know, if you're messing around with all the ladies, you probably better not get involved in any sort of dispute. Now, Tristan, Senzo, Steve, Davi, competing with the sunset. You haven't seen the Mara sunset yet. We're not quite at that stage, but I assure you I will try and champion them all with my dramatic skies. It may not be a beautiful sunset because there's lots of clouds, but it will be dramatic and it will be beautiful. So the challenge is on. Now, I've said this about every lions we've seen. We've seen a lone lioness, we've seen the river pride, and here we have the boys that we were looking for earlier. And I keep saying it's getting cooler, it's getting darker, they're going to stand up and my goodness they are they they just haven't moved the sort of paler male towards the tree he hasn't even opened these eyelids i don't think he looks really comfortable and he's just completely in his dream world so i cannot believe the number of lions that we have seen and the number of cats that he or anjuma have seen they are obviously all celebrating fun day sunday uh, we might have put a little bit catnip here and there. No, I'm only joking. Of course we didn't. It just is an extremely lucky cat day. I don't think I've ever seen this high number of lions in one drive before. So I'm in a bit of a pickle. Do I stay with the boys or do I go back to the River Pride? Oh, it's a big choice for me because the River Pride are not in the best position. Quite far away for us to get a good view. And these boys are literally within arm's distance. They are so close, just snoozing by the tree here. So I'm in a bit of 
bit of a pickle, but I would really, really like to see these boys stand up. I haven't. It's been some time since I've spent... Yeah, it's been quite a while since I've spent some time with male lions, actually. We did have Kapuli before I went away for a few days. But other than that, it's always been lionesses. So I think my heart is telling me to stay here with the boys. And as you know, I did mention the darkness of their manes is very strongly, directly correlated to testosterone levels. So this just proves that these are indeed very prominent and dominant males in their prime and a male lion's prime is said to be around five to seven years so i um the, this must mean that these lions are right in their their prime and chris is saying that this is half tail and fang I think that was the two names that Chris mentioned, and indeed, I believe it is. So finally, I have managed to ID some lions. We still are struggling with that first lioness, but I will get there. I took lots of photos, and I promise you, I really, really will get back to you on who that lioness is. But these are the Kichwa boys, and yes, Chris, I believe you are right. I am wondering... Actually, I think this is the first time I have had a very close encounter with the Kichwa boys. I don't have the best memory in the world, but yes, I think it is. So hello, boys. It is a pleasure to meet you. Oh, look at this. This one's jaw moving while he's sleeping. Oh, that's so cute. Oh, he's talking in his sleep. That's so cute. Okay, I'm going to keep my eyes open for our dramatic skies that are going to champion Juma. But for now, while I stay with my sleepy boys, we're going to send you back down to the beautiful Kuchava. Well, Lauren, thank you for linking back to us. I know it's exciting to see the Kitra boys, but well, we've got Kuchava, the beautiful female leopard, up in a tree. The sort of stereotypical leopard shot in the Sabi sands of a leopard perched atop a marula tree looking at one of the most beautiful sunsets. I mean, you can actually see the glow of the sunset on her face as well. Leopards also take a bit of time in their day to enjoy the sunrise and the sunset as we do. And I wish both Lauren and Tristan well on beating our sunset this afternoon. It's not, not really a competition. It's all about us providing the beauty for you and then you are to decide. I mean, how can we even talk about sunsets with the amount of leopards and lions that have graced us with their presence this afternoon? Beautiful, beautiful girl. So this is a strategy they employ as well for catching animals because the leopard's got a much better view up in a tree there um, they can obviously have a very nice nap considering that they can't get snuck upon by a pride of lions or hyena so they can have a proper little sleep but then also if any movement happens to sort of um, betray an animal's camouflage somewhere in the thickets she'll be able to see it <coughs> race down the tree to be able to catch it and catch you want to know if females develop dewlaps and no it is something that is designed for males it's designed for protecting the male's neck making him bigger stronger thicker intimidating um, i think those are the main reasons for the dewlap um, but not all males develop a big dewlap it is probably a genetic thing as well maybe a testosterone thing we noticed for sana before he disappeared it was only slowly starting to develop one and his father has got a magnificent one. But I've seen leopards in the past that haven't really had a very well-defined dewlap. And I'm sure a lot of it's got to do with genetics. Even in Vula, when I last saw him looking quite skinny, had still the remnants of a dewlap on him. pretty so as I said it is raining cats this afternoon and consulting detective you love the dangly legs well she's sitting like such a lady isn't she sitting with her on the side of her bottom there 
uh, with one leg down the side, one perched up by her head. And uh, sometimes you'll see leopards sitting similarly to this, except all four legs draped on opposite side of the branch. And they get quite uncomfortable with the full belly of meat. But she looks rather in her element, doesn't she? And the tail hanging just off to the right to add in some wonderful sort of wonderful sort of balance. You can hear the sounds of another vehicle. They've just come in to enjoy this wonderful sighting up here in Chitwa. Okay, well, from Auntie, who's looking rather hungry and rather snoozy, let's go back to Tristan, who's with her niece, playing with her in Parlour Meal. Well, that's not really a niece, what you're looking at there. The niece is behind, busy feeding away. That's a little bit more kind of... I don't know, <laughs> it's quite a close-up of those organs, but it is indeed. Kachava is, is the auntie of Klalamba. Is it? No, it's the older sister. That's, that's right, it's not the niece. Um, Kuchava is her older sister. I don't even know why I thought it was her niece for a second there. Um, it was the same mother. Potentially different fathers. Um, more, uh, I mean, Kuchava looks so much like Mvula. In fact, she's proven to be Mvula. Kalamba, we've sent off her stool sample now. So we'll see what comes of that. They were taken last week. So it'll be interesting to see what her paternity test comes back as. I mean, we, we say Tingana um, due to his behavior around her, but we'll get hopefully conclusive proof that it is hers. We also sent Hokumori's DNA off as well, which is good news. So that will at least be in the library and it'll be interesting to see which cubs he's fathered um, over the next few years. Um, so that Panthera project at least is still going on and, and hopefully will continue for a long time to come. It's not obviously only to do with paternity and, and maternity and all these kind of things. Um, it's also to, to try and do DNA testing and sampling of as many leopards as possible to try and start kind of ending the trade of leopard skins within South Africa. So a lot of the testing that's taken place is sampled and it's not just here in the Sabi Sands. Um, those, those samples are taken and then whenever they recover any sort of skin, and that is a real skin they then do a dna test on it and they can actually figure out from where those come and what's quite scary is that there were some skins that were found in natal which is a part of south africa the sort of eastern coast of south africa markers that matched one or two of the leopards here in the sabi sands which is pretty insane so but very very long time ago not any time recently before anybody panics um they old old skins and old kind of dna markers that have been had and very far removed it's not direct descendants that are kind of cubs or anything like that so before anyone panics and before anyone states that karula was taken or anything like that it's not that and it wasn't even karula's lineage either before that happens because i know how people like to jump to conclusions when it comes to these things and it is most definitely categorically not the case that her family is even involved in this it was nothing to do with with the leopards from the northern sabi sands at all. Now, Sands, I'm going to go forward a bit for you, just so that you don't have that bush in the way. And you look very smitten, young lady. But anyway, it's an important kind of process that they're going through and hopefully will continue to go through. Have I left one branch in front of her face? I have, haven't I? No, there we go, that's okay. Yes, clean that face, make sure that you are well groomed. I have this funny feeling that she's going to just pass out and sleep fairly shortly and we're gonna have to try and kind of sit here and be very patient with her over the course of the next hour. As full as that belly gets the more kind of sleeping she's gonna do. Right now it sounds like the sunset challenge has gained momentum and Lauren now wants to compete so let's send you up to the Maasai Mara and see what East Africa has got for us. <laughs> <laughs> I did just throw myself into the challenge. I wasn't really invited, to be honest. And you know what? I'm just going to judge my own sunset. Okay, I may be bending the rules here. It is technically a sunset, but of course, it's not going to be the type of sunset that I know Tristan or Steve showed you. However, I myself, I'm declaring myself the winner of the dramatic skies. Isn't that just stunning? Pinks, purples, a little orange glow with all these dramatic, hopefully not too heavy clouds. 
I declare myself the winner of the dramatic sky. So thank you, Tristan, for not inviting me into the challenge. That will be remembered. However, it is just absolutely wonderful to look at. And Emma seconds me. So I have backup. Isn't that fabulous? Now, we have moved to give you the sunset, but we're going to try and go back to the boys. It won't be the best angle. It's probably a little bit X-rated. However, I'm just going to show you who is who because we managed to get a good look at them. So they're on the other side now. And the darker one is half tail, short tail, sorry. Because you can see, or probably you can't see, when he just moved his tail, he's actually missing the end section, the tip of his tail. It's not a stumpy one like the Chelly Boys. It's just missing the last sort of segment of his tail. And then on the left, the much paler one is Fang. So that's who these boys are. And even when we turned on the engine and decided to move, they really haven't moved a muscle. So I apologize about this view. It's definitely not as pleasant as the other view. So what we're going to do is just move back around and we'll try and get their faces again for you and while we do that we're going to send you to Gigi who's somewhere over that way with cubs very good job uh, Lauren to have gotten the kitchen is where we are it's just windy and windy and windy you can see how the trees are being blown by the wind, but these cubs are not being moved by that wind because they're saying, this is our trophy. Our mothers, our aunties did a very good job. We are not going anywhere. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am back uh, to the sausage tree pride. And you got two cubs there, one female on the right, two youngsters right on top uh, of that one. And the female to the left there, that's just about, yeah, exactly, that is eating the back uh, of that buffalo there. It is called Limpy. Now, finally, because of the wind, you remember, for those of you who are with me before, I was saying I could smell the carcass, but I couldn't tell where it was. But I knew once the wind would come, I could zero in in a particular direction. And one, I didn't know what carcass it was or what animal or what prey it was, but now I've been able to identify it. It's a buffalo. They have done it again. And if I'm not wrong, it is another male buffalo. Why they don't bring down females, I do not know. But in general, nine out of ten times, this pride brings down buffaloes. That is Limpy, that's her name, the one just moving there. Colleen, good question there. And you're asking, where did the term Dagger Boys come from? I mean, there have been some two theories. Number one, buffaloes are not easy to kill. And when lions go for them, Colleen, they have been known to hurt lions and they have been known to go them using their sharp horns. You know, Colleen, a dagger that people would use? I have seen not, I can't remember what countries, but I think it could be the Yemen's where either the sultans or the kings would carry daggers in the very special sheath. Now, those daggers are always big and very sharp. But also in South Africa, uh, dagger could be, it could also mean mud. But here in Kenya, for us, when you say the dagger boys, we always mean the buffaloes and more so Kalin, the males. Because if the buffalo and especially and so and most of the males, as I said, would get not only the lions but even us locals. It usually hurts people, and they have been known, even after killing people, they have been known to shred people. They've been known to tear people's clothes. They have been known to shred people's bodies. And Colleen, that's where the name Dagger Boys came from. Well, I do not know how Dagger Boy this is, but. The sausage tree pride have always come out unscathed or unhurt by the buffaloes. Now, I got two females here. I'm still yet to account for the other three. And before I left this sighting, I had three and I was missing two. Now I got two missing three. I will need to see all the five and I will say they are all in good shape because this buffalo to me looks like he was a big boy you just look at him and he was very well built as much as they go down they go down fighting 
Now, why I don't, what I don't understand is that little cub there, you know, sitting very close to Limpy, not eating. Irish, where we are now, this area is called the Sausage Republic, or rather, it's the territory for the sausage females. Irish lions are very territorial, and where uh, Lauren is, is such a long way from here. So that particular territory where Lauren is have different pride males. Now, Irish, the pride males for this pride here are called the Old Donio Park. Look at what Limp is trying to do to turn around that buffalo. So it's very difficult for the Kicho males to get here because if they do, they are going to get a very big fight from the pride males of these females that is called the Old Donio Pike. Now what uh, Limp is trying to do is to turn around that carcass and maybe to be able to reach to much fresh or much softer uh, flesh, I guess, and maybe also help the cubs to reach, you know, some soft meat because what it is now is so much thick skin and the cubs cannot do much. All right, Limpy, let's go. One, two, three, pull, Limpy, let's go. One more time, Limpy. Now, she may need the hand of another female or she may need the hand of the males. Now, the first time I got here, I did not see any males, and not even now, but I know they are not far. But what will be interesting is if the males would arrive, one of them, I can tell you, all these females, all the cubs are going to step back and allow the big boy to eat. Limp, you got some job to do there. You may need to call your sisters or your cousins to give you a hand there. It's not easy what she is trying to do. Ideally, what Limpy is trying to do is to turn over that carcass and then the cubs get access of the much softer meat. Otherwise, as it is now, it's just the skin. The skin could be about half an inch or one inch thick. It's very difficult for the cubs to just dig in uh, their teeth to reach uh, the soft meat. So either Limpy will have a little commercial break, have a rest, or just go and call your sisters or your cousins to come and give you a hand. Limpy, will you do that? Now look at her as she walks. You'll very easily pick she limps a little bit. But not always, sometimes she walks nicely, but then you can see how she throws her head up. Well, I'm staying with these lions a little longer. I'm not going anywhere. And I also believe Steve Ovo has gone back to the Nukuhumas. We have indeed, David. We are with lions that have not only finished eating their meal, they've spent the day slumbering. Missing one member. It's possible they're trying to find her. Here they are, the Ngohuma Pride. Four of them leading the way. Of course, it's the females leading the way. Males are still sitting over there. There they are. There's the oldest lioness about to arrive next to. Looks to be the Mangeni male. Let me just check his face. Yes. Love the sound of lions calling. It's just a soft mm, contact call. Try and find out where their missing members are. They're walking back in the direction where they had the giraffe, baby giraffe, this morning. Mm -hmm. Can you see her? She's covered in it was probably stomach content, everybody. Mm -hmm. Being 
very vocal this evening. Excuse my silence, everybody, but they're just such wonderful noises. There's a proper belly wobble there. So, five have gone up. There's a male here couple more youngsters there and then two of them have gone down to drink but I've no doubt they're all going to follow each other in a moment Contact calls almost like a little sulky noise. Such wonderful sounds here. They are being very, very vocal. They were behind on the side of that tree earlier. shared amongst family. <laughs> that was hard work. Flopped on the floor. You can see the size difference between the female and the male on the right. They will be of similar age. Working off their dinner or their breakfast. Check calling as they go. The problem is where they're headed could either be over to Little Gauri, could be south, they could go into Juma. Let's hope everybody. Hold cross fingers they go into Juma so we can follow them. Could go either way right now. Crossing all of our fingers. Those of you who forgotten or are not aware we do have a tv show starting at half past six 
in about half an hour or so. And, well, we would like to show our South African guests our lovely pride of lions. She's got a bit of a limp, this one. It does happen. They do injure themselves in hunting. If you jump onto the back of a giraffe and maybe fall off, it's possible to injure a leg or sort of... Oh, wow. There we go. That lion <laughs> passed me. That is the Mangeni male for sure. Look at the size difference there between him and that lioness. Yeah, I think that's all of them. Are we going to try to get up ahead, try and get a bit of a view in front of these lions? They're headed sort of in that direction, sort of westish and north. So if they just follow the road, they'll be in Druma. How nice would that be? So we're just going to drive up along the side here. See if maybe we can keep up with them. <clears throat> well, thanks for staying with us during that, folks. That was awesome to see all the action, all the, the noises. But there's nothing more rewarding than watching crazy lion cubs. Well, Steve, I agree with you. And ladies and gentlemen, you'll notice now that the same lions you're seeing a few minutes ago may look different simply because we have gone to infrared. It has gotten a little bit darker here. And we thought, let's not shine anything artificial to these cubs. And we are now in what we call infrared camera. Same camera, but you just make sure that nothing artificial will go to these cubs, not to affect their behavior they'll continue eating, they'll continue drink what they're doing, and we'll continue also enjoying them. I'm sure you know, we are always one hour ahead of South Africa, and more often than not, sometimes it gets darker here than it, it does in Juma. The wind is still blowing, and one thing that will not change, these cats are not going to leave at this uh, buffalo. They're not going anywhere, and if anything that would make them rise up and behave differently would be anything like a hyena. But not rain, not wind, not sun. They are here to stay. The cubs now, what they did, they just thought they better go around and try and sneak and dig for themselves some kind of soft meat. You can see that one. <laughs> what an angle uh, he got, I guess that's a boy there trying to reach the meat from, you know, the other side of the buffalo. But if I'm asked, I would have gone around the other side, just go right in and feed. So we got now three females. I can't see uh, the other two very well, but right in front of me, Abunge, if you see a little bit to the right, there's one mama there, and just next to her, uh, two females. Thank you very much. You see that one there? Yes, that one, I'll be able to identify who she is. You can hear some of the cubs calling. I'm not sure we can hear because of the wind. Where are you going, little one? Okay, you want to go somewhere, maybe to the bathroom? But any good mother will keep an eye. So as you see, she's looking as much as, you know, she's walking away. Okay, that other mother has woken up. It's very matano for the mothers to make sure that everything goes right as the wind continue blowing here maybe they're going for a drink who knows so the mother is trying to follow them so windy windy so what we want to do is to go back to those uh, two cubs who, that are still on the kill and find out whether they are getting lucky because I think the mothers need to turn this buffalo the other way around. Otherwise, they are struggling, struggling. Well, as we find out if the females will come and turn around this buffalo for the cubs, let's go back to Lauren because I think her males are up and about. Well, 50% of the Kichwa males are awake and ha half tail here. <laughs> I have such an issue saying half tail because he actually has his full tail. It's just the tip that's missing. So apparently he also gets called snip. <laughs> 
and I much prefer that name, but we're going to stick with Half Tail, which isn't quite accurate, but we'll stick with it, is giving us a glorious view of his mane. Let's take a closer look at that mane. It is fabulous. And you can even see, although we're in IR right now, we're using our infrared camera, you can't... Oh, big yawn. It's a hard life being a male lion, isn't it? So you can even see the contrast in colours between the sort of really orangey fawn colour with that dark black mane that extends. Okay. Well, he obviously wasn't overly amused at us talking about his mane like that, but you were able to see the contrast and he did sit up and that was absolutely perfect. It extends, oh, there we go. It extends all the way down his back and all the way down his chest. He is in, oh, standing up. Thank you, half tail. Oh, we look a bit stiff there. Is that a limp or is that a stiff leg? I am not entirely sure there. Oh, there we go. Just for the end of the show, he decided to collapse, disguise himself amongst the long grass. So we'll take one last look at Fang here, who does have his whole tail intact. But he has a rather funny mouth and missing canines. So they've both sustained injuries in their life, but they're definitely males in their prime and they are absolutely glorious. So I do hope they stand up shortly and entertain us. However, I'm very happy to see them for now. So please do join us tomorrow on our sunrise safari. I'm sure you're all happy it's back. See you then.